looks like we are rolling. Hey guys, uh, it's Renee here. Thanks for coming out. I have been wanting to discuss this subject. I had videos up on it before, uh, but uh, I didn't. I didn't discuss it that much because it caused so much division. And since I was doing nothing unbiblical anyway. Uh, I figured I would wait till somebody that's even more informed than myself to discuss the issue of women and their roles in the church, because there's some uh, verses that are pretty controversial and they don't seem to match Paul or Jesus's view of women at all. Um, if you take, because we're told to take the full counsel of God, uh, you have to look at it at, at a whole and uh, you see God using Deborah as a leader in the Old Testament. You see Phoebe, the word uh, is used. Deaconess is the word used. It's the same word for deacon in Greek, but for some reason the King James Bible translates it minister or servant. Depends on the uh, one you're using. And we know that Paul sent her to read his letters as a fellow worker in Christ to all the church. And if women have to be silent, how did she read the letter? I mean, I'm assuming she had to make some noise to read the letter to people. So uh, those verses can't mean what people say they mean. Um, and I did a lot of study about this before I began my channel, lest I do anything unbiblical or offend God. And I am certain that I have not. Uh, uh, I do know that God reveals he's not a respecter of persons and he reveals his truth to anyone willing to seek him for it. So, uh, and it's the duty of all saved believers, brothers and sisters in Christ to preach and teach what they've learned from God to lift up the brethren and also to bring people to the knowledge of Christ. So I have someone that has researched this extensively. Paula, uh, her channel is Bible literalist. And she's very well educated in this. And I, I'm going to ask her some questions on these uh, uh, very misunderstood verses and uh, the history of women in the church in the first century and up until now. And we're going to discuss the attitude and how that's actually, I believe, causing division in the church. Uh, I actually had one person get saved on my channel, then come back later and tell me that someone told them they were sinning because the woman was teaching them something and that that made me really sad but i told them they need to follow their conscience if they felt it was a sin to that god couldn't use a woman to help them understand uh his his good news then you know they had to do what they had to do uh but i i hate it to see this so paula has actually written a book on this subject and i'm gonna let her um tell you about that paula would, would you tell us what this book is actually about and what inspired you to, to write it? Well, let me uh, share this just for a little bit, you know, just so people know what it looks like on my website. Um, this is uh, written back, and I think I wrote it in 2009, and I wrote it as a Bible study. It, it's a through the Bible study. Uh, okay. I was hearing an echo or something. Yeah, yeah, I fixed it. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, and basically, I, I start with, you know, I introduce the topic and then uh, you can, I don't know if they can see the, the channels on the side there or the chapters on the side. Um, I look at Genesis, what happened in the Garden of Eden, because that's badly misunderstood. When, when Paul refers to it, we have to know what he's referring to. So we have to look at Genesis. And then unfolding revelation is the rest of the Old Testament, basically. Intervention is when things change when Jesus came and then how we are in Christ, a new creation. And then all the teaching letters. Um, I go through all the New Testament teachings on the issue and then summarize it. And so that's what the book is about. And I wrote it as notes I was taking while I was studying this and learning about um, mistranslation issues, because this topic, uh, I, it just didn't, the way people would interpret the passage just didn't make sense to me with other parts of scripture. And so what I did was I, I, you know, I did a lot of other research and came across some people such as, uh, Catherine Bushnell, who lived in the early to mid 1900s. 
Uh, she was a medical doctor and a missionary to China, and she discovered that uh, the translations into Chinese were very inaccurate when it came to women because she confronted the uh, translators and said, why did you do this? And they said, well, we have to honor their culture. And, you know, of course, that was very wrong. And then she began to wonder what else had been mistranslated even in English. And that sent her on a long journey of studying both Greek and Hebrew that she knew pretty well. And she would bounce her ideas off of scholars of her day to make sure she wasn't missing anything. And she uh, wound up writing something called, uh, well, it was a series of lessons and it became a book called God's Word to Women. And I can get people the, the link to that later. I can, I can send you the link um, of her studies. And so that's what really, that topic is what really got me studying Greek. And um, so, like I said, I, I just discovered things and wanted to share them. And that's what turned into a book, basically. So, Paula, lest this, this is going to happen, I am not a feminist. I believe that men and women are equal in value. Uh, but I believe that we have our differences. And then when together, uh, we complement one another. So I don't believe women are greater than men. And I don't believe men are greater. So I am uh, first thing we're going to be called are feminists. And I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not a feminazi. I'm not a feminist at all. I believe uh, that that's a very carnal way of looking at the situation. And I don't believe God sees us by the flesh. I believe he sees us by the spirit. Um, but just to make it clear, uh, are you a feminist? Are you anti-marriage? Are you any of that? No, I'm, we're coming up on 30 years. Uh, this year. So something is working and we, you know, we never had a problem with any kind of power struggle. It was, we each recognize what each of us is best at and let them lead in what they're best at. And that has, I mean, we've, we could probably count on one hand the times we've ever really had any kind of argument. And even then uh, there was no screaming or anything like that. It was just misunderstandings. Um, you know, this isn't the way my mother made chili, you know, right. something like that. But um, this is, it, it works in practice. And there are a lot of people who would give lip service to role playing, but in practice, it's egalitarian. And that's the word we usually, you know, people get triggered by that word egalitarian, but right. it just means nobody's better. Like you said, right. that's all it means. And Recognizing each person's gifts and talents and personality is just common sense or should be. And that's all I'm advocating because I believe the Bible is a common sense book. I don't believe that it says stupid, ridiculous, conflicting things that we just have to believe because, you know, it doesn't make sense. But wait a minute. My Bible says God is a God of order, not disorder. And come let us reason together. So right. we have to, if there's a problem that needs to be fixed, it's because our understanding is in error, not because God's word is in error. Right. I, I wanted to tell you before I began this channel, there's so much religion here in the South. And to really look down upon that women, they can only teach young kids. And even when a boy gets a certain age, they can't teach them anymore. And they can't do this and they can't do that. The best you can hope for, I mean, our own people at church told my son on a trip, the best thing you can hope for is to be a wife of a pastor. And my son said, gosh, hundreds of people have gotten saved on my mom's channel. God can't use her. She can't be a pastor. Like just, <laughs> he didn't, mm -hmm. even say, well, whatever. I know that she's working for God and he's using her. So whatever. Um, yeah. And I only do this not because I want to be a pastor. I have no desire to be a pastor. Right. It's, I want to know truth. I want to know what God says about us. And I don't believe it based on how I see Jesus making women evangelists. I mean, the woman at the well, and he always chooses the thing that's less honored in the world or thought of as weak uh, or even despised. Uh, right. He always chooses the thing that the world doesn't elevate or celebrate. Right. That's so the, none of it made sense to me. That's the that chapter on you know, in the book that I mentioned where we're going through the Old Testament, God always picks the younger over the older, the, the few over the many, the um, the weak over the strong. 
because he gets the glory then and not us. Right. And that was the whole point of it. And that is a big deal because uh, like you mentioned with, um, you know, things that don't make sense. It's like when you, when you say that uh, they would say, well, women can only teach children and, and other women. Why would God put the most vulnerable people in the hands of the most deceivable people? Right. Does that make any sense of our God? Right. You know, he just wouldn't simply do, simply wouldn't do that because if they were so afraid that we were such terrible teachers and that somehow truth becomes error when it passes over our lips, why would they put us in charge of the most vulnerable members of the body of Christ? It makes no sense whatsoever. So See, this, I, I don't get that either. I don't, I yeah. think these verses, these controversial verses were about very specific teachings and very specific women uh, right. and very specific issues going on in those churches. Um, right. And uh, that's what people aren't researching. And I yeah. researched it before I began and I came to a similar place. But when I try to tell people, they say I'm lying or I just want to be a woman pastor or I'm, I want truth. And I know God yeah. has revealed amazing things to me in scripture. And I know he's used me mightily and I just couldn't understand why would he use something that he considers less than why would he just pick somebody else? You know? Right. And people will say that they'll cite some proof text in the Old Testament that God only chooses a woman when he's scraping the bottom of the barrel. There's no men available and the nation is under judgment. And that's one of the <clears throat> passages that Karen Bushnell came across. It was very badly twisted by bias that, uh, you know, women shall rule over you and children, you know, you know, that passage. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't say women and children at all in the Hebrew. It has to do with vow pointing, which is much later than the originals. They didn't have any vowels and how you point the vowels makes all the difference in the world. And she goes into detail in her writings about how this is never translated that way anywhere else in scripture. And the Septuagint actually gets it better. It says that uh, tax collectors will rule over you and exactors or, you know, uh, a parallel crooked, word. Crooked politicians and crooked leaders. Yeah, they're going to yeah. glean you like a harvest. They're mm -hmm. going to pick over the little, you know, the innocent people, and that's what they're going to do to you. That's the judgment on Israel. Mm -hmm. It's not women and children. Because mm -hmm. I can't see where Deborah was a terrible leader at all. No, she said she was a thus saith the Lord prophet. Mm -hmm. You know, Deborah, Hulda, uh, there's another one whose name well, there's is escaping also the prophetess me. that spoke over Jesus. Yeah. I mean, you know, even in the Old Testament, do we think things got worse under Christ for women? We've had all those women who were, in, and Miriam was another one. Um, she was called a prophet, and she would say, this is what the Lord says, and nobody had a problem with it in right. the Old Testament. And so, Jesus uh, said that Mary uh, was doing the good part. She had chosen yeah. the right thing to sit at the feet of the rabbi and learn from him. Instead right. of serving with her sister, that's unheard right. of. And from what I've read, the problem Martha had was not that Mary wasn't helping in the kitchen. It was a, it was a scandal for her to sit at his feet like a rabbinical student alone, mm -hmm. especially. Mm -hmm. This was mm -hmm. scandalous. And that's what was bothering her. And Jesus is like, no, this is better. This is what. And you don't sit as a rabbi student unless you're going to be expected to be a rabbi someday yourself and teach. Right. right. You know. So that was a scandal, but it all really starts in Genesis and Eve. If we really think about what happened in chapter one, it says that God made them male and female in his image, and they were given rule and dominion over the earth together. People will say even today that women are not made in the image of God. Mm. And I take them to Genesis and go, look. Male and female, he made them. In the image of God, he made them, and he gave them rule, etc. And so she is made in the image of God. And chapter one is an introductory summary. This is how ancient Near East histories were written. You put the summary of the book at the front, and then you went over in detail. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to say that she wasn't around when that command was given. You know, this is the summary. This is the gist, the important thing of the book of beginnings of generations. That's where we get Genesis from, was that male and female were made to work together and subdue the earth and take care of it. And they are both made in God's image. 
Now, chapter two, this is the more detail. And I, I could go on. I want to take the whole time on that. But the thing is that this is so foundational. And Paul's going yeah, to refer to it. So. Please. So chapter two um, is, is more detail. And then it says that, uh, you know, God brought all the animals to Adam to name, right? And the word Adam, by the way, is named after the red dirt that he was made from. It's a word that basically means red. That's the color of the dirt. I've seen red dirt. I, you know, it's a real thing. But um, it's, he brought him the animals, but it wasn't until then that he that God said it's not good for the man, the Adam, the person, the human, the earthling to be alone. He didn't say it. Adam didn't say it, I'm lonely. Where's my mate? He didn't say that. God said it's not good for he, him to be alone. I will make an ezer konegdo in Hebrew for him. What does that mean? Well, we see the word ezer used for God all over the Old Testament. He is our eben ezer, our help. That's what ezer means. Konegdo means a strong one facing him, an ally, somebody who has your back. That's who Eve was. Why did Adam need somebody who would have his back? That's the really interesting question I'll get to. But it said it wasn't, he showed him the animal and said it wasn't good for him to be alone. After he had told Adam to guard the garden, not just, but cultivate and keep. Keep is like my brother's keeper. Mm -hmm. It's a guardian, a protector. He was supposed to do that to the garden, right? But it's not good for him to be alone. Why? We find that out in chapter three. In chapter three, is when the temptation happens, right? Why does the serpent go after Eve? She is the last thing created. She did not see God create. Adam saw, well, he's asleep, but right, he's like, you know, God put me to sleep and then I wake up and there's this woman. And the first thing he says is, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He did not say what's different about her. He said, what's the same? And that's because God had just showed him the animals. You're not, she's not like those animals. She's like me. That's what he was saying. How much the, she's his equal. She was his clone, technically. He was not talking superiority here. He's talking, this is one like me. And bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So chapter three comes along. Why does the serpent target her? Because she never saw God create. She didn't know. Everything was done when she got there, right? So she was inexperienced. That's what her vulnerability was, inexperienced. And so, and I forget what verse it is in chapter three, but it says, you know, that she was beguiled. That word is very strong in both languages. She was mesmerized, okay? She was tricked in a, the deepest way, but her, she gave some to her husband with her. He was standing there. The whole time, he was not beguiled. She wasn't running around behind his back. I said, people make up Genesis 2.5. Well, they just, yeah, they just add stuff that's not there. They make up a story about her sneaking around or messing around with the serpent, which is utter blasphemy. Right. I mean, it's right. a terrible slander. She didn't know those things. She didn't want anything until she was beguiled. There was no hint of anything going on. And he was standing there heard the voice of his wife. That expression means he was listening to her. Not just he took her advice, but he heard what she was saying. She, he heard this conversation and he took the fruit, fruit with his eyes open. And notice before this, God just said, don't eat of that tree, right? Or you will die. Dying, you will die. It's just emphasis. And so why were these other penalties added? And this is where it gets really interesting. Because more happened, obviously, than them dying, which I take to being being mortal. Okay, because some people say death of the spirit, but death yeah, is separation. I think it's mortal too. I think they lost yeah. their immortality. That's why he blocked the tree of tree life, of so they life. would be immortal exactly. in the body. Yeah. So she's been tempted. She was beguiled. She hands it to him, and he eats it. And then they cover themselves. Right? They both knew they had sinned, so right. they were both had their eyes open individually responsible. Be, and then God confronts them. Why does he confront this order? Adam, Eve, serpent, Eve, Adam. That is a mirror image, a chiastic form, right? 
And what's at the center, the pivot point, the point, the main object. So it has nothing to do with authority, has nothing to do with who is made first. It has to do with the point of the confrontation, which is the serpent and the remedy. So he talks to Adam first and says, what'd you do? And what does he say? That the woman, woman you God, the woman tricked me or told me or something. That <laughs> woman you, you gave, gave me. me. You gave me. Yes, it's your fault, God. You gave me this woman that did it. Yes. That's exactly why all the other curses happened. He didn't just eat the fruit. He blamed God for it. He blamed God and Eve, everybody but the serpent. And he wasn't tricked. Let's set that aside for a minute. He confronts Adam, says, what did you do? And then he confronts Eve, and what did you do? And she just says the truth. The serpent tricked me, and I ate. She didn't pass blame. She's just saying that's what happened. And what? then God turns to the serpent. He doesn't ask him any questions, right? <laughs> he, he's just like, he didn't ask him what he did. He's like, right. you're cursed above all the livestock, and you know that, all the rest of that. And her seat, you, you know, there will be enmity or extreme hostility between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head or crush your head and you will bruise his heel, right? What stop there? What is going on with Eve? She is being honored, elevated, exonerated. Why her seed? Why not his seed? There's something wrong with Adam, not wrong with Eve. She is truly his help. Get it? Right. Help. This is why the man should not be alone. He needed a helper. And that helper would turn out to be the seed of the woman. That's how she was his helper, not his secretary, not his assistant, not his servant, his savior, not by her, but by her seed that would come from God alone because no man's seed would be involved. Right, right. In my opinion, this is pure speculation, but if she had not followed him out, and I'll get to the language of that in a minute, it's quite possible she would have given birth to that savior without Adam's involvement. A lot of people think that uh, that's why Satan had Cain kill Abel. He never knew which one was the savior. It could and be. It could have been Eve's next seed. Hey, there it is. That, that's the savior right there. We got to kill him. And we yeah. know it's not Cain because he's the wicked one. So it's got to be Abel because he's the righteous one who offered the lamb. And what did uh, chapter four, just to jump ahead a second, chapter four, one says, Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she gave birth, conceived mm -hmm. and gave birth to a son. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I have created a man. Right, right. So going back to Genesis three then, so the serpent is cursed. We have the first proto evangelum, which is, you know, the savior is going to come from her seed, not his. And then he says to her, which is, I think, already mangled in the Hebrew, but said properly in the Greek Septuagint, is your turning will be your husband. The word is apostrophe. We know what apostrophe is. It turns back. Mm -hmm. That's where we get that word is from the Greek word to turn, to turn back or turn away or turn around. And so the word in there in Genesis 3 is apostrophe. You will turn back to your husband and he will rule over you. It is not a command. It's not a curse. It's a prediction. She's going to turn and then he will rule over her. So it isn't that she desired something. And in, even if somebody wants to take the desired word, which has bad connotations that's put in there by the, the Hebrew rabbis, even if that, it never existed before sin. It never existed before the temptation. It did not, it was not something wrong with Eve or God had made something not good. So we can't blame God for this by making Eve the villain. She is the victim here. And just before that, you know, you will turn, God says, a snare has caused you sighing and sorrow. I forget the exact words in Greek, but she was tricked. And it's talking about a snare, a snare, a trap was led, led, laid for you. And that has increased your sorrow and sighing. And that word sorrow is the same word that was given later to Adam for how his toil would be. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do, it, it, you can take it, depending on the, which manuscripts, that she would have pain in childbirth, of course. But in Greek, it gives the idea of increased conceptions. That is to say, having more children than she would normally have had. And this would be her undoing, basically. So the, the problem here is that people are telling women today to make Eve's grave mistake, which is turn to their husband instead of God. She could have stayed there with God. She was tricked. She was a victim. But... 
she turned away. And especially the Hebrew, if you look at it, God says, now that the man, specifically now it's Ish and Isha, she's the Isha, he's the Ish. It's now the man will must not be allowed to stay here and eat from the tree of life because the man was, you know, uh, he has he's going to be returned to the dust from which the man was formed. Eve was so, not formed from so the dust. He chose her husband rather than God. Yes. Now he was the one made from dirt, right? So the dust you will return from dust you came. Eve did not come from dust. She came from Adam. Adam came from dust. That's why the ground itself was cursed mm -hmm. because he was taken from it. Mm -hmm. And he was not allowed to eat from the tree of life. He was driven out. It doesn't say them. The translations right. put them, but it says he, the man, was driven out. She turned to him and followed. And that's why she suffered with his fate. Oh, so, that's interesting. So if they you really the language, put that. They really they do that. Everything's Eve's fault, and man is above the woman. And no matter what, you got even the pastors tell abused women if one yeah. of you are trying, you can make it work. And they're staying in these horrific situations. It's just horrific how bad it's been twisted up. It is. And I've there are websites of women who, as young girls, were abused by church leaders and made to stand in front of the congregation and say that they tempted the men when that wasn't, they were oh, yeah, their fault. Yeah, it's their yeah. fault. It's always the woman's fault. It's the same thing in Islam. It's yeah. really disgusting. And they'll send women back and people like John Piper will say, she should suffer for a season, you know, even at the so-called Christian husband's he hand. He doesn't even know if he's saved or not. What is no, he he's, I, don't get me started. But the <laughs> thing is that, <laughs> that um, suffering for Christ has never come at the hands of a Christian. It's supposed to be persecuted for your faith, not being beaten because you cooked that's your right. steak too far, to, you know, something yeah, like that. Right. So the, the point of, of Genesis is that the woman was the victim of, te of deception, right? And she made a bad decision after that. So when Paul refers to that, what is he saying? If you look at his context, he's saying, she was deceived. And he's talking about going to, to Corinth, or no, Timothy, um, First Timothy 2, I think it is, and saying she was deceived. If you look at that language, there are two words in that passage that he writes to Timothy about the woman keeping silent. Okay, so that's the big proof text. Two words that are called a hapax legoma, which is a word used only once. And in the entire Bible, there are two words there that are only used once in the Bible, and even rarely in classical literature. The one is authentine, or, you know, there's various endings depending on the parts of speech, but authenteo. It does not mean authority. There are other words for authority that Paul even uses in that very sentence. Authentine or authenteo means, it, to best they can figure, is always negative. It has to do with murder or violence or domineering, abusing someone. And that's what she was not to do. Not to say men can do that. Because the problem was there was a woman there doing that to a man. Why was she doing that? If you look at the backdrop, Timothy was in Ephesus, right? Apollo and Diana worship. Di yep, yep. The temple of Diana, great is the goddess. That I try to yes. teach people that this all is contextual about fertility rituals and and goddess worship. Exactly. All of that, and they they call me a heretic. But well, I, I did. I researched this. Please explain what is going on when he's talking about the woman in silence. What's that? Is right. It, is all women. No women are allowed to ever talk in church. Or, yeah, that's is that what that thought. <laughs> <laughs> because in that in that context, you know, Apollo and Diana were twins, I believe, in Greek mythology. And the worship involved, they would have these big orgies, you know, uh, whether it was food or whatever. And the priestesses were like well regarded. Bacchanalian, Bacchanalian place. Yes, that's exactly what it was. But these people were getting saved, right? In Ephesus. And Timothy was there to try to, you know, help things along there. But what I've been able to piece together is that this woman, unnamed woman, has converted from that. She was a priestess. And she was walking into the church thinking she was all that. She was just going to start teaching. Right. And she was teaching that the woman came first and all these other mythologies that she had grown up with. And she was a priestess. And she thought, and she was 
abusing a man because of this, right? And so Paul is saying, and his whole letter's about false teachers, he's saying she needs to stop and sit and be quiet. Hesusia does not mean do not speak. It means be a respectful student. And that's all it means. Because there are other situations where you find that word where it's like, wait, how can they evangelize if they're supposed to be completely, utterly silent? My pastor like believes that a woman can't even speak. Only time I, I'm allowed to speak, even though after church, I, I will have a full on, he knows that I understand scripture. Mm -hmm. he, I show him stuff all the time. He knows it. He knows that God shows me things. But I'm the only time I'm allowed to speak is on Wednesday nights when people are allowed prayer requests. We're That's not even allowed to read scripture. Wow, Only men are allowed to read scripture in this independent fundamental Baptist church, and that's that's the overarching principle that it tells me that they don't understand the gospel when they say things like that. Because what did Jesus come to do? Did he come to put a shine and polish on Judaism? The captives free, yeah, not so among you. The greatest must be the least. And at the last supper, he washed people's feet, his own disciples' feet, and he came to Peter. He says, "You, I, I have to do this. You have, or you will have no part with me. Why? Because a leader has to be a servant." He turned that upside down, and that word "support" hupatasso mean is the literal meaning is an attached document to a legal case that supports it. Right? It gives legitimacy right. to the case. It doesn't mean subservient. It means get under somebody and lift them up. That's right. That's, That's right. what the Last Supper foot washing was about. That's yep. what Jesus said, not so among you was about. That's what the word means. And there's another one, hupakuo, which is you get the word acoustics in. It's to listen to. Like when the servant girl was uh, answering the door when Peter got out of prison and he's knocking on the door, she answered the door. She didn't right. submit to the door. Right. Right. She didn't obey its commands. She answered the door. Right. So, if you know those Greek words, and that's why I got into Greek, because I wanted to know what these words meant. And that one authentio meant abusive things that a woman was not supposed to do. And in that, he also says not only to be silent, but he says why. He says, but the, at, the man was made first, then the woman. So he's talking about the Gnostic backwards thing. And he says, but the man was not deceived, but the woman. But he said Adam was not deceived. And then he said the woman being deceived is currently now in a state of deception. That's the way the Greek reads. It's a present condition going on right then when Paul was writing. She is now in sin. Who? Can't be Eve. She wasn't even alive. It can't be all Christian women for all time. It's that woman who came over from Artemis worship, who was teaching falsehood, needed to sit down, was not allowed to teach because of that mm -hmm. until, and then we come to the next rare word, which is technogonias, which can mean childbirth, which most of them translate that way, but it also means child rearing, which is like mentoring. You bring up the child because if you break down the language there, he's saying she will be saved if they remain in faithfulness. Who's he talking about? And they fill in the blanks with whatever they feel like all, if all the women do their roles. Mm -hmm. No, not even. Yeah, they say that the woman really doesn't have any purpose but she'll give she'll get some purpose once she has some children. That's yeah, what so I think it means. And I knew that wasn't the case. Because that's salvation's that by case. works. And as one person pointed out, works of a most unusual nature. Yeah, and also to do to have children. wouldn't have advised against marriage for right. certain people if that was the only purpose they could serve for God. Right. Paul's children. teaching is that singleness is the ideal Christian state. Right, because your focus is always on Christ and not having to care for the, the, a family. So and what he's saying on. in that passage is we got a false teacher. She needs to sit down and start from square one, just like he himself had to do. He was right. the greatest Pharisee. He had to be knocked up his high horse. and be, He was taught by Jesus personally in Arabia for like three years. And then he started evangelizing. Anyway, you can preach the gospel right away, but you can't be a teacher. Right. And so he had to be validated and it took time and he got words directly from the Lord. That's why right. he's an apostle. Right. So he had to humble himself. He counted everything loss. It really says in Greek, a pile of manure, right? His credentials. So why wouldn't he be telling her the same thing? You have to humble yourself, start right. over. I wish they'd have been clearer though. I really wish they'd have been clearer because it's yes. her well, horrific. But it, again, it's a letter to a specific church. So whoever was writing the letter was responding to something specific. Right. That's
that's what Paul did in most of his letters, especially for his current, you know, Corinthians. Yeah. Which is another thing if we want to jump to that topic, because it was the first chapter. He says, everyone follows this person, that person, the other person, right? That word in Greek is, I am of Apollos. I am of Paul. I am of Kephas or Cephas or Peter. But when it comes to Chloe, they say from Chloe's household, the word household is not there. It is not there. It she says converted people. It says ran a church. Chloe ran a church. I do. Know. Yeah. She said some under of Chloe have mm -hmm. told me. Yes. Her we, house. They church. Found them. They found churches between the first and third centuries owned by women, run by women. Christian churches yes. says to the God, Jesus. In a mosaic on the floor. Yes. Owned and run by a woman. And some of those had they have found had been defaced to hide the women in leadership positions. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that in First Corinthians, if this is a house church run by Chloe, she sent her people to Paul with these questions. So we're hearing half a conversation, a question and answer, and those are so badly translated, they're missed. And I looked up Greek grammar sites to know exactly when something is a quotation. It's not always clear, but there are clues in the text. And the thing about uh, women must be utterly silent in the church and not allowed to speak because it is, the word in Greek is very strong, vile for a woman to speak in the meeting. That is not in the Old Testament. So Paul is quoting them, and that saying comes from the Talmud that women are vile and must be silent. Uh, He's not quote the law is oh, so it's actually quoting. I see what quoting he's doing the there. Talmud, not the law of Moses, because you can't find it there. It is not there. There's no and such so law. He's saying that's not accurate. I'm saying the translation is hiding that this is a quote of the question brought to him. Oh, I he, see. I see. Yeah. So the question was, hey, what do we do? Because the Talmud says it's vile. Right. Okay. They so were going to the Talmud. Talmud. Well, and I, it's really sad because these yeah. things are so strong in scripture. And those yeah. two verses are what I know my pastor stands on. He even apologized. I'm sorry, I can never have anything for you to teach. You're you're very knowledgeable. I wish I could, but I can't. He is hamstringing the body of Christ and telling the body of Christ that it has to operate with one hand and one foot because they divide, literally teaching the teaching of division, dividing the body of Christ down the middle. That's why the cover of my book has basically a tasteful dismembered body because that's what this teaching does. And that book isn't just about the women, men thing. It's the clergy laity as well. I've had issues. channels made completely against me that claim to be on the right gospel. They're Baptist men mm -hmm. that have come against me in the most horrid, cruel. I, at first, I was just a sister deceived enough to think I could talk about anything other than just the gospel. I can't explain any scripture at all because that's not permittable. Then I became an unsaved Jezebel along the way. We all get so, called that, don't we? <laughs> yeah, they, they love the word Jezebel because it's the way to insult me and do it biblically and uh -huh. look righteous doing it. But nevertheless, it's still name calling and it's ugly. It and is. I know that I know God's using me and I know what he's shown me and I have heard his voice. I know I, I heard him tell me not to go to seminary. And so I thought, hey, maybe it's true. Maybe I'm not allowed to be a pastor. So I didn't go that way. But that's not it. I believe he didn't want me to do that and that uh, I would have learned error in the seminary. But mm -hmm. I, I felt like um, there's no way when I look at the first century church, look at the list of women that he calls his fellow workers in Christ. Yes. Half of them are women. And, and then he sends Phoebe on her way and says, give her anything she needs for her work. And he uses the word proestomy, which is one who stands before. She is a representative, an official. And she that's why she was given the letter to take to Romans and, and to read it. And the reader was supposed to expound and to be treated as the author. Right. That's why I was like, so. he sends her to read these letters, not just probably one church, maybe more. Right. And the word for her, deacon, diakonos, is the masculine form. There was no feminine form of that word. And it meant one who dispenses service, like a waiter. So when okay. King James did it, he assumed women couldn't hold any position. So they changed the word from deacon over to minister or servant. 
Well, actually, the thing is they could do it either way, but they are not consistent with it is the problem because everyone could be considered a minister. That's what minister yeah, means. Yeah, but they're it trying to put a deacon for men. They, when men yeah. are names, they put deacon there, and it's the same right. word. It's, it's the same word. Biased. And the thing is a minister is what a deacon does, okay? And so everybody, every Christian should be a minister. Right. We're supposed to serve, give right. service. The greatest should be the least. The one at the, you, are you at the one at the table or the one waiting on them? You're supposed to be like the waiter. That's the deacon. That's what we're all supposed to be. And so would they take these terms and make offices out of them that don't even exist? It's just like when the instructions for elders or episcopi, you know, whether it's overseer, elder, guardian, um, they, they are describing the what they do, what it's called, you know, they're just different terms for the same thing, really. And they say, when it says the, uh, the deacon, or not the deacon, the um, overseer, I think is the word there, um, must be husband of one wife, for example, right? But here's the thing is it's, it's, first of all, it doesn't say if anyone wants, if any man wants to be, it says anyone. The word anthropos in Greek is non-gender specific. Greek uh, gender is the masculine is inclusive. So if there are any men in the group, you use the masculine form. If there are no men, you use the feminine form. Okay. So we got the masculine form there. It means anyone, anyone at all who desires the, the not and the word office is not there, but this service of being an overseer desires a good thing. And it says husband and one wife, what that means is it's an expression, a figure of speech, meaning faithful to your spouse. And in that culture, nobody had to tell women to be faithful. They already knew that. The men did not. Right. That's who had to be told. And that's Paul's habit in all his letters. He tells the group, like, you want men to pray without arguing? It's not Why because women are allowed to argue. The way they translate these two sections in the pastoral books just makes no sense based on how the women are shown up so much in the first century church. And did, didn't you say they used to joke on Christianity as the women's religion? Yeah, I forget where I read that, but it was part of the historical complaint about Christianity. It was a, a, a women's religion that, you know, the men wouldn't want this because it's for women. Because women were being freed not to be wild. It's like the general principle of the gospel. Again, we're free from sin, not to sin. And so the women, some of them were going overboard and thinking, I don't have any responsibilities anymore. They were just, it was going to their head. And that's why in some places they had to be corralled because Paul's principle in all his teachings is what brings honor to the body of Christ and the church and what does not. Like for Corinthians 5, there's this guy living with his stepmother. Mm -hmm. And he said the surrounding unbelievers are shocked. Mm -hmm. So he says, you're not you, so named among the Gentiles. They don't right. even have a name for it. It's so bad. So his principle is always do what honors God, do what does not give him a bad name. You don't do that. And so the women in Crete, for example, when he writes to Titus, he says, these women are being irresponsible. Their culture was you had to stay at home. They were neglecting their home and their children because they were Christians. And he's like, no, 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 no. He's not saying all women for all time and all cultures must be homemakers. He's saying these women are giving us a bad name. So the women elders, and it is, you know, when he's contrasting, he's using the word presbyteros and there's a feminine form because they're male and female, but not because only women can teach women, but because the women in Crete needed to be taught how to be homemakers. And right. who else was going to teach them that? But the women elders, right? right? So because he also says in the wording in that in uh, Titus, I think it's chapter two, says that this is in keeping with their appointment. You can't appoint someone to age. Right. You appoint them to a position. Right. And the position was described in chapter one. These must be the highest caliber people of good repute who handle the scriptures properly. And so these women also were appointed to that position. So you don't believe that Paul would tell a godly woman, say like Phoebe, who was well-versed in the scriptures, uh, that wanted to serve and had a love for the brethren, that she wouldn't be allowed to speak or teach anybody 
anything. No, that's preposterous. I mean, he's, he's teaching, he's just but trying to, now. yeah, I mean, he's trying to juggle these problems. He's dealing with specific problems. It isn't just false teachers. It's only it's in the pastoral behavior. books. It's only in the pastoral where he's telling them the standards for running right. church. And it's like with slavery or anything else, Paul or nobody suddenly wanted to overturn society and make a wreck of everything and make the church have a bad name. He's saying, okay, slavery is a thing, but if you get a chance to be free, take it, right? But if you're a slave, this is you should be the best slave. Mm -hmm. And so give a good reputation to the faith. Right. And so he's not endorsing slavery. So right. why would he be? That, oh, see, they say no slave. No, just like God always worked within the corrupt human government, God didn't right. go overthrowing human governments, no matter how corrupt right. they were. He would just work within them. It's like the illustration of people pulling a heavy cart up a hill, right? And every once in a while they got a rest. So they put a block behind the wheel. What's the purpose of the block? Not to pull it, to keep it from regressing. Okay, going back down the hill. That's when God intervenes in history throughout the Old Testament. He's like putting up when he'll intervene, he'll put a block there, basically saying, don't go backwards. Like, here's the law, you know, and then here's the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So the bar keeps raising, but he doesn't do it all at once. And it's like with slavery, you know, it wasn't meant to last forever. But while you got it, here's your rules. He gave rules for Israel how to treat the slaves, how not to mistreat the slaves. And then he gave rules for Christians. If you're in that situation, serve God, serve them as you're serving God. And so when it comes to women, why do we make an exception? The same principle holds. You're in this culture. This is how you can best represent. Right. And in Peter, in first Peter, where he says, be like Sarah and all that, that passage, He's saying, and the if I and I in the book I think I color coded. Well, I couldn't color print that one, but in my on my blog I color coded the grammatical gender of the words. It is the men who are supposed to fear. This is talking about Christian women married to non-Christian men, and they couldn't talk about their religion. It wasn't done. You could be put to death by your husband. So you couldn't witness with words. That's why you had to have this character and be like Sarah. Calling her husband Lord, when did she do that? One time when she laughed to herself and said, now that my Lord is old, am I going to have this pleasure? Mm -hmm. So that wasn't her regular habit. And in fact, God told Abraham to listen to her regarding her, her handmaiden Hagar. So Sarah was brave and forceful and principled and talked to God like anybody, you know, anybody else did. That's what Peter is saying, don't be afraid. Why would he turn around and tell her to be afraid? He's telling the man to, to fear the Lord because of her witness. And he, the man, the word there is hostile to the faith, someone who is dead set against it. That's when you can't talk. That's when you live it out. And that's all Peter is saying. Right. So those things, all the proof texts are badly twisted. And it boils down to this principle of, you know, the greatest should be the least, is that if that's our attitude as Christians, not seeking to lord over, then how can that be put into the most intimate relationship where suddenly Jesus' words don't matter anymore, the greatest pulls a trump card and says, I'm the tiebreaker, you have to do what I say. What kind of a Christian has that attitude? Because of their flesh, you even mentioned at the start, in the Old Testament, um, when uh, Samuel went to the home of Jesse to pick the new king of Israel mm -hmm. and he had the sons pray and he looked the first one that this has got to be the guy. And God says, I don't judge people the way you do. I don't look at the flesh. I look at the heart. Yep. Has that changed? No. Now, mm -mm. God is still not a respecter of persons. Nope. So why does the flesh matter in the church? It doesn't. See, I church. have said that. I've said, look, no male, female in Christ. They go, that, that doesn't mean oh, that the man that. doesn't still have authority. Who wants authority? Over, over who? I'm yeah. not married. No, no man's got authority over me, but Christ. They will say you got to be under some male's authority, whether it's a pastor or a brother or an uncle or somebody, because and there's I something put wrong with you. Under it for that reason, you know, I did that, yeah. and yeah. I and I find stuff he's saying wrong, and I love him, and but I, I just I can't. And that's the thing is, we're not seeking to rule. We're just seeking. They're the ones with the ego problem. 
with the. I don't want to rule anybody. Yeah. I just like sharing with my brothers and sisters what I learned. Right. And his love and how it transformed me and how the real message of Jesus is you can't do anything. He did it for you. He loves you. Please receive it. That's right. all I've ever said. I've never said stay in sin. Uh, sin doesn't matter. Just live any way you want. Destroy people. Be a jerk. You know, none of that. I'm, I'm just saying don't trust in anything you're doing to right. save you. And I want people to hear the real message of Jesus. Right. And that, you know, it's never so I can be over anybody. A matter of fact, I'm constantly bullying, bullying myself, telling people my flaws all the time. And my enemies love to use them against me and make videos and show what a terrible person I am. Because I, but I don't preach me. I just don't think it's right that they tell me that God can't use me when I know good and well that he speaks to me and he is using me. And God. we have we have women prophets, even Joel, with who Peter quoted at Pentecost, said your sons and your daughters your would prophesy. daughters would prophesy. What is prophecy? It's, it's the opposite of priest. Word. Yeah. A priest represents people to God. A prophet represents God to people. Philip, the evangelist, had four prophesying daughters. They were not silent. Mm -hmm. And how, why would it, do people think, because Paul said, well, the head coverings, I might not get into that, but the thing is that it has nothing to do with the way it's been translated, but remind me later if we have time. But the thing is that with prophecy, at one moment we had Paul saying she has to remain utterly silent. Another part that Paul says she has to prophesy with her head covered. How is she supposed to prophesy? And if it's only to women, why does she have to cover her head? Right. It makes no sense. And there is no word a sign of in 1 Corinthians 11. There is no a sign of in the Greek. It is that she has her own authority. The situation there, we got question and answer again. They said, we're at a dilemma here. We don't know what to do because if she, you know, in Christ... We don't have this shame that the men in Judaism would cover their head when they prayed because of their shame. That's taken away in Christ. So that's why a man should not cover. But the woman is the glory of man. So if the glory, if someone who is the glory, like the man is the glory of God, is not to cover, then why should she shouldn't cover either? Because she's the man. She's someone's glory, too. Not this is not about image. It's about glory like a trophy. Right. I get and you. yeah, so. He's, they're saying, what should we do? Because our culture says only loose women don't cover. And Paul says, hair is nothing. It actually is not a question in the Greek. It says, nature does not teach you. That, and it isn't even long hair. It's fancy hair, ornate hair, done up perms, yeah. basically. You know, That's what he's saying. That's not what you should do. That's not what it's about. The kingdom of, he says, you know, and the order of things about head coverings. And this word, kephali, for head. There's a literal word, head. And then there's a figurative word, which did not include authority or boss. It meant the source of, like the head of a river. Mm -hmm. That's what it meant in Greek. Or like the first person to go out to battle was not the general or the king. It was just the strongest person with the, that's what a double-edged sword is. Mm -hmm. The strongest guy would have a double-edged sword because he would go out there and slash back and forth like this. Right. And open up an opening so the army could go in. That's what a kafali does. Okay. And so he's using a play on words. He's going to talk about head coverings because that's their question. He opens with Christ, you know, the order, I forget the exact order, but it's, you know, uh, you know, the head of Christ is the head of, or, you know, God is the head of Christ. And, but head means source. The order does not make sense as a hierarchy. God created man and woman was made from man and Christ came from a woman. But he's talking about sources because he's going to talk about heads. That's the play on words. And then he's, they ask him his question and he says, nature doesn't teach you anything about it. Um, and you get, get into the thing about angels and all that. And people say that an angels would be moved to lust if a woman didn't cover her head while she's praying in church. First of all, good angels are not moved to lust. Bad angels would not only be moved to lust in a church setting. For crying out loud. At any time. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, this doesn't make any sense. The thing is that she has authority on her own head because this is a dilemma, right? He says, leave it up to her. It's her head on the line. Literally. She could lose her head for doing this. So she decides whether to cover her head because we have no such custom. It does not say no other custom. The word is not other. It's such. We don't have a custom figure it out your own selves. 
let the women decide. And he says, although the first woman, the first man or woman came from the first man, ever since then, all men have come from women and everyone comes from God. So he just put a nail in that coffin right then and there and says, order of creation is irrelevant here. You all come from God. You all came from women. So no more talk about who's in charge of who because of when they were made. Mm -hmm. This is not about flesh. This, our faith is not about flesh. It's about spirit. And the Holy Spirit does not give out gifts in pink and blue boxes. Thank we you. already know we got women prophets. We mm -hmm. got women who were teachers. We got women who were proestimies, you know, and deacons. We have women who were co-workers. We have women apostles like uh, Andronicus and Junia. You know what they've done to Junia? They've done a gender bender on her. They, yeah, there were three. Junia was a woman's name. Yeah. They, they, but they made it a male in the in the Bible. Oh, well, it gets worse. There's three different things they've tried over time. The first one was to make her a man. The masculine form of that name did not exist before the Middle Ages, but the United Bible Societies, I think in the 50s, decided to make it a masculine name without following their own rules for attestation. They had to have textual backing for, they were responsible, right, for the original language integrity. And they broke their own rules to make her a man. And every Bible translated for 50 years took that error with them. Mm. And then later, the, the, too many eyes looking, they changed it back quietly again without doing their own rules and just said, well, it's a feminine name, but the footnotes will still say, or maybe it's this masculine name. When they know well and good, that's not true. There was a woman uh, whose name escapes me at the moment who has since passed away, who read Greek for pleasure as a child. She was reading the classics. She was calling wow. these guys out wow. and they absolutely tried to destroy her. Wow. Um and she knew what was going on, what they were doing with uh, Junia's name. She has a whole section on Junia, a whole series of posts on Junia. And there are other men who do the same. This is not a men bashing thing. Is there are plenty of men egalitarians who will say the same thing. Yeah, I, um, I actually researched that. There's yeah, a group of them. And what's interesting yeah. is women are offended at this teaching we're talking about. Yeah, women I mean. Say, no, the man has to yeah. like. They're, they're doing that. And that yeah. surprises me. So there are women, what they call complementarians, which is, it's like calling China a people's republic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Complimentary. Is by everybody right but left. the people. <laughs> yeah. This is complimentary, not hierarchy that they, yeah. they have take, they have taken over the word, but it's called Christians or, uh, uh, I can't think of this. What's the name of that organization? Uh, wait, I'm losing. I can't think of it. There's Christians for Biblical Equality, is the egalitarian organization, yeah. and uh, something for biblical manhood. The something for biblical manhood and womanhood. CBMW. They're the ones who push this nonsense and push it hard. Mm -hmm. And so these these two organizations developed in the same year. They've been at it ever since. But I forgot what I was going to say before. I but oh, the three things they've done to Junia. One was change her into a man. Then they couldn't get away with that. And then they said, well, she was only known to the apostles. She wasn't one of them. Well, the Greek construction does not allow it, and everybody knows it. She was an apostle. And then they said, okay, she's an apostle. Well, she didn't have authority of apostle. She's just an apostle, you know, a lesser grade. Any There's no such to thing. Lower, any way to belittle yes. the position. Yeah. It's desperation and they can't even sustain that because there's no such thing as levels of apostles. You are one or you aren't one. Well, like uh, my friend, uh, uh, David over at ultimate, uh, I mean, not David, Michael over at um, ultimate Mordecai, he, he jokes about it, how the Jehovah's witness call them the super fine apostles, <laughs> the super fine, <laughs> like they're the real deal, you know, like right. the super, super fine ones. So uh, yeah, you won't find that at all. Um, Right. There's no hierarchy and you won't see anything remotely set up like the Roman Catholic Church where this right. one's under this one. And that's corporate worldly set up. That is not biblical Christianity at all. That's another uh, historical thing that a man, Philip Schaff, historian, wrote uh, History of the Christian Church. He has a section 42, Christ, uh, Clergy and Laity, where he lays out the beginning of that hierarchy. And that is in the second century. And, and remember the apostle Paul told the people at Ephesus that after his departure, ravenous wolves would arise from among them and scatter the flock. This is what happened historically, what Philip Schaff 
chronicled, and he said they couldn't sustain that lofty place of the, you know, Acts 1 and 2. Of everybody was taking care of each other as a community, and everything was fine. But the Jews, with their religious practices, the Gentiles, with their religious practices, couldn't give up priesthoods, altars, hierarchies, and they brought it in. And he called that section from organism to organization because it was supposed to be a living, breathing thing, a family, a body, and they turned it into a business. It's like there's a saying, and I'm going to mangle this one too, where the uh, Romans turned it into a government, the Greeks turned it into a philosophy, and the uh, Westerners turn it into a business. It's exactly what happened to Christianity. Mm -hmm. So there is no hierarchy, even in uh, Hebrews 13, where that's another badly translated thing to foster this hierarchy, which is those uh, verses 7 and 13 or 14. 7 and 14, I think, are the ones. It's uh, obey your rulers who have the charge over. It doesn't say that in Greek. It says, listen to or be persuaded by those mentors, those guides of you who brought you the gospel and copy their way of life so that you don't make what they're doing their responsibility a burden. Their responsibility is to nurture and train. And if you don't pay attention to them, it's going to go badly for you and it's going to make give them a headache and they are responsible for you. So try to go along and take the mentoring and this is what the wording is in Greek. It's not about rulers. It's about, that's why we have teachers and elders who guard. The guardians on the wall are not the magistrates. They're not the kings and princes. They're really lower ranking soldiers, right? But their responsibility is very great. They have to see danger coming and warn about it. And what do we do? We throw rocks at them when they warn. Right. We say, don't tell us these negative things. Let these seekers in. And but so they don't get any respect. That's what we do. That's what we do when we, we're calling out error. We're being the guards in the walls and we're getting shot at from both sides. That goes. Oh, through. yeah. Uh, you know, I believe God preserved his word in the original languages. I think they are preserved in those original languages. And I think they're really, really close in most of trends like King James and Geneva. I think they're really, really close. But I can't help but think there's some bias when they do translate. There uh, absolutely is. So I, I don't want to say there's error because I, I don't believe there's like error. I, I believe God preserved his word, but I believe they're perfect, perfect in the original Koine Greek and Hebrew. Right. But I think once you've taken it from that perfection and translated, there's going to be a little bit of difference in it. There's always something lost in translation, and people don't realize that Jesus and the apostles quoted the Septuagint, which was a translated translation and not a perfect one, but they considered it, and everyone considered it, the word of God. Mm -hmm. And so even the King James translator said in their preface, even the meanest, which means crudest, least skilled translation is still the word of God. Right. And the kingdom of God is not to be reduced to words and syllables. Right. So... God preserves what he wants preserved, and it's our job to rightly divide it and not go by tradition, not bow to culture, and culture has been largely patriarchal. Yes, it's it cannot has. be divide, denied. So if all we want is truth, and that's all I ever want either. That's, and I that's what I'm saying. I want the truth because yes. this doesn't work, and I don't like things that contradict because I know by, uh, God's word doesn't contradict. Right. So if he's using all these women and all these amazing ways and Jesus said it's fine for that woman to learn from him, that's actually the good choice for her to be a rabbinical student at his feet rather than serve. Right. And to send that woman, she didn't qualify. She was the least holy woman. She had five husbands with living with a man. She's the first evangelist he sends out. Right. You know, the women are the first to see him at the tomb, to see him risen and tell everyone. And, and, and then Paul has uh, Phoebe and uh, uh, Junia and and uh, Priscilla Chloe and, and Ella, yeah, and all these all these amazing women holding all these positions, and then you see like two verses about she, they got to be silent, and I suffer not. None of this worked; it didn't make sense unless Paul's a schizophrenic. So I knew there was something more to those verses. I said, "Look, this is a letter. He's answering something we don't see, and this right. has got to be a specific thing." And I didn't understand exactly what was going on, but I did know Ephesus was the place where they shouted out 
great as the goddess Diana. And they mm -hmm. had a huge fertility cult. And there was a lot of, they were usually run by women, priestesses, and that there right. were converts uh, into Christianity from those religions. So uh, I, I did know that there was more to it, but nobody wanted to hear it because everybody likes the way it is. They like the men up here and the women got to obey all the, I don't believe that. And right. I, if somebody's wrong, they're wrong. If somebody's right, they're right. But I think in the, in the church, we are, one in Christ. We, we are spirit together. And, and you can't uh, uh, look at flesh and you can't look at wealth and you can't look at these things. Right. And, th and that it's sinful to do that. Why is it sinful to be a respecter of persons regarding wealth and not be a respect and, and to be a respecter of persons regarding flesh? Exactly. The kingdom of God is not about our flesh and there is no authority that resides in our flesh because yeah, that, that's why it, it pulls the rug out on, on from under this whole debate over who can have authority over who. Cause nobody has it. Tied by, and I love him dearly, but look how my hands were tied by my own church. Yeah. I can't offer anything. And I knew it when I went in, I just went in to be, to be a part of a real gospel place so I could support missionaries. Yeah. And my hands are tied into service of my own church. They're, they've bound and gagged you because yes. of the flesh, only yes. the flesh, pride in the flesh. This yep. is not what we're about. This is not what the gospel's about. It's about setting the prisoners free, lifting the burdens. This was an, and I wrote an article uh, on my blog once called Sound Familiar because I went through all the civil war arguments on slavery and how the church was using those verses. And people were saying, you know, there were some people were of conscience and knew the Bible saying, look, God cannot be teaching slavery here. They were on Didn't the they remember the part where the judgment came on the people that enslaved his people? <laughs> yeah, and the thing is that he's saying, how can we take Jesus' words about lifting the burdens and opening the prison doors and put the people right back under those burdens or right back in those prison doors when, you know, how can the Bible be seeing that? And I said, okay, now let's go back and read that all again, but instead of slavery, we're going to change it to women. Mm. Same arguments are being used yes. to to say, well, let's appeal, you know, society would fall apart if we gave them equality. Slavery, women, same argument, you know, or it's God's natural order. They said that about blacks in the American South. God's I natural order. Give Brother Luke and those guys credit because many men, there's been men that have refused to join the panel over there because I'm on it. A woman should not be teaching anything. Her opinion shouldn't count. It should. I mean, it's ridiculous. And these are young men that yeah. believe this way. They're being taught this way to believe that God, I, I can't. Now, I didn't say anything wrong. It's not that I said anything wrong. They couldn't find anything that I said that was wrong. It's just that I'm a woman and I'm not allowed to do it. Apparently, you don't have the Holy Spirit then, because that's yeah. where the authority comes from. The right. from the scriptures and the Holy Spirit. And the truth does not become error when it passes over on women's lips. No, it is Nobody not. is being deceived. There's not something wrong with all of us as women that is not also wrong with all of them as men. Because why would God, back to the Garden of Eden, why would he be saying, oh, this guy um, just passed blame and blame God. Let's put him in charge of you. Mm -hmm. And he, because he wasn't deceived. No, he went with his eyes wide open and defied yeah, God. He one more at fault because he did it knowing he did it. Yes. And that's what Paul appeals to and says, even in the early in the first Corinthians, he says, I'm afraid that you've been deceived like Eve, the whole church, the men and the women being deceived like Eve was. Yeah. But they so, turn around and say, see, she's so weak. She got deceived, but Adam didn't get deceived. That's actually bad because Adam did it anyway. So she wasn't a help meet. She yeah, wasn't yeah, suitable, but they, they are, seem like her deception would made her evil. Right. But she was the bad thing because she was deceived. She was made of Adam's flesh and bone and God made her specifically to have his back. And somehow she's inferior. This okay. is, this is utter blasphemy. And Eve was being honored. I mean, she, yeah, she sinned. She became immortal. She paid for that, but she did not openly defy God. And he, you know, Adam elevated his sin and added to it. And, th and then she made the mistake of following him out. And that's why it all went wrong. That's why men have ruled over women. But in Christ, there is no. Right. It's reversed. The curse is lifted.
I mean, it it's says in Galatians 3.28 is not about who can be saved. It says, in Christ, there is no. You are mm -hmm. all one in Christ Jesus. No Jew Greek, so we're talking about ethnicity. Mm -hmm. There is no slave and free, so we're talking about social standing. Rich there is no male and female. And it even says Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female. It's different for that because it's an emphasis, not even this. There is no hierarchy. You are all brothers and sisters. And even Jesus said before the cross, don't call anyone father or rabbi or teacher because you have one father and you are all brothers and sisters. There's no hierarchy whatsoever. So what I'm saying is not women should be over men at no, all. I'm not. saying that's, that's what I wanted you to clarify, that you're yeah. not saying that either. Right. I'm saying nobody has authority because it comes from God, not from our flesh not from our standing, not from our ethnicity, not, it's not our skin, it's not our reproductive organs of all things that God would say. Right. You know, I got to look under the hood before I give you this gift. Yeah, I, 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 it amazes me. To me, that is such a carnal it is. way of looking. It's like they've, they've, they're stuck in the flesh. It's crass when you think about it. It's, it's, if they couldn't hear my voice or see, well, although I'm called a man, a trans... I've been called a transvestite before. Yeah, who has it now? <laughs> Maybe, who knows? But if they couldn't hear me or see me, based on just the words I say, they could hear the wisdom in it. But they, they're they they're blocked by the carnality of it all. They can't, they've been told so long that God won't use a woman. Back before anybody was on YouTube, there before there was a YouTube, we'd get in these discussions and message boards, right? And I would just pick, a, a whimsical name. You know, I didn't try to identify who I was. That was always kind of dangerous. Um, so you didn't want to say whether you're a male or female. And I was arguing with this guy who was a pastor and he had a, he put his real name or something, you know, cause I knew he was a guy. And we were arguing theology on this women's issue and he got exasperated and said that I was shirking my duty as a husband and father. Oh, that's hilarious. It is. And then I told him that I'm a woman and I'm married and I have kids and you know, he, I never heard from him again because you cannot tell. That's the point you were making. You cannot tell a male and a female brain, personality, anything alike. If all you see is words on the page, because mm -hmm. they're not gendered spirits. People want right. to argue that, but that is Gnosticism. Spirit. Yeah. Gendered spirits is a heathen pagan teaching, but not a Christian biblical teaching. God is spirit. The only time flesh ever, you know, there were theophanies in the Old Testament is take on appearances, mm -hmm. but only Jesus incarnated and he incarnated as a male because he was the last Adam. He was the promised seed of the woman mm -hmm. and he had to share in our humanity, which was right. why Mary is fully human and a sinner. And, in the, God, my savior. and in the culture, yeah. men yeah, who would have listened to him. Led. He wouldn't even be able to go into the synagogue and read right. or prophesy about it. Right. So there are a gazillion reasons why that had to be, but it has nothing to do with superiority any more than Jesus speaking, picking, picking, Jewish fishermen disciples means that all disciples must be Jewish fishermen. Right, right. You know, it's bad logic. I mean, it, right. they read too much into these things and all these symbols that uh, he only had men as his disciples. He had plenty of women following him, meeting his needs. They were benefactors. They had money. They had power. They uh, look at, um, what's her name? Uh, Lydia, seller of purple. She's a businesswoman like the woman, Robert 31. She ran her own business. Proverbs 31. Oh, yeah, yeah. It says uh, yeah. she, uh, she, she uh, buys up land. She sells her things in the market. She, you know, she purchases property. She does all of that. Right. And so Lydia was one of those women. She was a seller of purple. Purple is a very expensive garment then. And she was a businesswoman. And she invited Paul and Silas into her home. Her home. Yeah. And. Oh, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, just, the, just the, everything the apostles did, they had to learn that there was no superiority. First, the Jew Gentile thing, you know, they had to learn that first. Yeah. And then it Your was vision. a vision had to tell Peter that. Yeah. Three. Yeah. Times. And like you said, the, the first, the uh, woman at the well of Samaria, this woman who had seven men, she's the first evangelist and nobody rebuked her. And she, what, regardless of her reputation, went in and told everybody she was supposedly at the well. At the was yeah. yeah. She says, here's the Messiah. And the women at the cross. 
Only one man stayed, the Apostle John. The women were first to the tomb. Nobody believed them. Later, Jesus goes there and rebukes them for not believing mm -hmm. the women. Mm -hmm. So every which way you look at the Bible, God doesn't pick you because of your flesh, your standing, tradition, anything. He picks the least likely ones. That's why it was a woman's religion. That's right. Because they'd never seen anything like this before. And that's what was taken from us. The body of Christ was hamstrung, cut in half because of fleshly pride. Mm -hmm. And like you said, there are women who believe that. There are men who don't. So this is not a women against men thing. It's a truth against error thing. Yeah, it's that's a the thing I, want. I want people to understand truth here because I hate having my hands tied. I hate that, uh, uh, that limitations are put on what God can do and who he can use. And, right. and it's horrific. I mean, I had one guy, uh, it was a great, he was a great pastor. I think it was Jay Vernon McGee, you know, old school Baptist believed in me. He said, but I got my butt kicked because I went down to South America and there wasn't no man doing that. It was a woman down there building churches, risking her life. And God was using her mightily. And I said, I would never speak against a woman leading a church again. Good on him. Because like you said, there are women putting their lives on the line. They were doing that in the first century. Women were being hauled off. It said Paul was, Saul was hauling men and women mm -hmm. into prison and having them killed. There were women giving their life, risking their life, martyrs. How can anyone deny them? full equality when they're giving their lives in a way that most men never will. Yes, and, sons and daughters prophesy. It's yes. right there. And that's the verse I would use when people would tell me I had to be quiet or I had to stick to only the gospel. Well, how do I enforce the gospel and prove the gospel if I can't go into the Old Testament scriptures or other things to show you the deity of Christ and all the prophecies he fulfilled? I can't talk about right. any of that because I'm a woman. Right. I mean, it, literally what was going on. And like, like I said, women teaching other women, the blind leading the blind, if they think there's something inherently wrong with us right. all. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make if any sense. If we're so terrible, we can do it. certainly don't give us your children then. Right. You know, we're such terrible, deceived things that God can't use. Don't give us your kids to teach. Right. It's like you we know? have to yell unclean. <laughs> yeah, we're unclean. Whatever. Bad foundation, let a women get hold of them. Oh, you know, it's just. Yeah. Really silly. I, and I really did want to know the truth because it didn't make sense to me. None right. of it worked. When you take the full counsel, you cannot look at just one or two verses and build an entire doctrine on it when everything else in scripture says something different. Are we humble or not is the question for every Christian. I don't care who they are, what they look like. Are you grateful for salvation? Did you humble yourself to receive a gift? How can you not keep that humility and gratitude and serve other people and not regard for the flesh. How can a Christian have that attitude? Any Christian, I would appeal first of all to that principle in the faith is humble yourself. The greatest must be the least. Get under people to lift them up. Even Ephesians 5 says, submit to each other. It must be from equals serving each other. That's what it means. And that whole list of things uh, is how you serve each other. And then when he gets to men and women, there's no, not even a verb there. It doesn't say that the translations will break in the middle of a Greek sentence, start a new heading and say, wives, submit to your husbands. There is no verb there. It just says, wives to your husbands as to the Lord. What's he talking right. about? It's a sub point in a list of ways to serve each other and says, and it's a, what they call a pericope or bookends, which is husbands love your wives, husbands love your wives. And between that is how Jesus loved. This is your role model, not how to be a God, not how to be a savior, not how to be something other than an equal, but how to love because the men needed to hear that. What was going on there culturally as well? There's a thing called the marriage without hand that was instituted by Rome to try to mitigate against wife abuse. It didn't work, but they were trying this, right? What it meant is that a woman was given in marriage to a man, but the father retained ownership. He could take her back at any time from an abusive husband and give her to somebody else. So that was the marriage without hand. He did not give her his her hand, give him her hand. And so what was happening was that Paul was saying, no, your loyalty is not to your father, women. It's to your husband, your own husband. Why does it say own? 
was she being promiscuous? No, women didn't need to hear that. What they needed to hear was that her loyalty was now to her husband, not her father. And because of that, Paul gave the balance. He said, husbands, love your wives. And at the end, it says, or the wife may fear her husband. Mm. What's he talking about there? Because the Greek says, or she may be afraid of him. Because of that marriage without hand, if he tells the men, that tells the women to be loyal to their men, then he has to tell the men to love their wives and not be harsh with them. Not Because a man don't, doesn't treat his own body. That's this whole paragraph on that point. This is why you love your wives. Why you love your wives, not how you rule your wives. And they've totally, totally twisted that. I was going to, uh, hey, chat room. I was going to ask you if you had any questions uh, for Paula or you wanted to mention anything regarding this subject, please type it in all caps in the chat room now and I'll give it to her. Um, one of the uh, people said, Joan of Arc was a woman and she was a saint and she was burned at the stake as a witch. I, I, I'm a little uh, leery of Joan of Arc because she was a Catholic, not just because she was a Catholic, but because she claimed to have heard from dead saints and she worshiped Mary and these Marian apparitions appeared to her and they're very unbiblical messages she was getting. Mm -hmm. I fear that poor Joan of Arc didn't test the spirits. I think she was deceived by lying mm -hmm. uh, fallen angels. That's what I believe. And she ended up dying uh, uh, for getting involved in human politics. So right. I, I, I don't think she died a martyr for the cause of Jesus at all. I think yeah, she was a warrior. So <laughs> yeah, different thing. Yeah. So that, that wasn't quite, let me see here. Um, I know Jezebel. She got eaten by wild dogs. <laughs> yes, she did. Yeah. And as many, as many want to call me her, I'm not her. Let's see. Paula, Syria, a person or a city. Paul calls her the elect lady. Ah, John, our second John. He says to the elect lady, the word is, uh, from the base word of curio, where we get Lord, Master, Sir, that's the base word, right? And all the, if you look at Strong's, all the definitions of any form of that word all say that, except for the feminine form, they say lady. The only way you can call a lady is if it's as in opposition to lords and ladies like that. She was just a feminine one. Okay, so he's calling her a master a respectful address, just like not every instance when people talk to Jesus, they didn't know he was Lord. They called it's him a person, sir. Though? They're asking, is it a person or a place? Yes, she's a person. Okay, it's a person. There's there's very little support for it being a city. There's there's just it just doesn't fly. Uh, but it's didn't a person. John, second John. John write a, didn't John write a letter to a woman too? A, yeah, that's Second John. Okay, that is okay. Yeah. To the elect lady and her children, he's talking about a church leader and her followers. Can you speak of Ohilaba and Ohala? What's the moral to their story? Um, fill me in on more details on those. I don't know. Ohilaba and Ohala, I don't know what they are. Yeah, he'll have to tell me more about that. Liberally conservative, honey, I don't know who that is. Oh, Ohilaba and Ohala, what is the moral to their story? I don't know what that means. I think it's an Old Testament thing, but I'm not, I don't remember the situation, so he'll have to explain. I don't, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, I know I've heard it somewhere, but I, it's, oh, is he talking about the two Hebrew midwives? Was that their name? Midwives? I don't know if that's who they were. I thought one started with a P, but I could be wrong. Well, what's the story of that? Well, the two Hebrew midwives, in, when they were in captives in Egypt, they were told by Pharaoh to murder all the baby boy Hebrews, right? And they didn't do it. Okay, Victoria. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, that's, that's a, just not uh, a big they, deal there. But. They, uh, Victoria asked, because uh, Brother Dave wanted to know if there's a, one evidence of a pastor or bishop that's a woman, but you mentioned that Phoebe is a deacon. Yeah, and uh, a proestomy, uh, one who stands before. Chloe was a church leader. Um, Lydia invited people to her house, you know, whether she had, she was meeting with women, right? And she invited these men into her house as well. 
So, but the, you know what you can't do? Find a man called a pastor in the New Testament. Yeah, there's no such thing as a pastor in the New Testament. There. Nobody has a title like that. Right. Bishop or deacon, I think. And Phoebe was a deacon. It's the same Greek word. They just translate it minister. And then the same Greek word they use for deacon for the men, but they change it for a woman. And then you heard her talking about Junia, who was an apostle, and they tried to make it seem like she was a man, but she was actually a woman, and they had to come back to that. Um, and there's a lot of confusion because of the pronouns, obviously. And then, uh, like she mentioned, Chloe was the leader of a church. So, yeah, there's lots of evidence for women uh, that are leaders and hold positions in the church, in the Bible. Uh, but people like to overlook them or rather minimize their position in order to uphold their false interpretation of the comments made in Timothy and the Timothy uh, books about women being silent and suffering a woman to teach. Uh, ask this lady her thoughts on the didash, the didash. Didache, uh, the that teachings. Is. It's a it's a document, an early church history document. Oh, okay. Uh, just teachings, but he has to be more specific. Oh, John, he's the, our Catholic friend. Oh, oh okay. Uh, yeah, I need to, a, a more specific question. What about it? <laughs> he said, "What about it? It's a big subject, <laughs> John." I mean, I they're John not scripture. Is a big subject. <laughs> so oh, I can say they're not scripture. So. It's not teaching. scripture, she said. So uh, if you, I mean, she'd be willing to answer it if it was more specific. It's just too too big of a a thing. I, if, if it's a if it's is it something on doctrine? Because if it's Catholic, it probably won't agree completely with scripture. I, it's been a long time. I don't remember anything glaringly wrong with the document itself. But what's the point? Is why you know it's it's not a scriptural thing. So okay, it's early okay. church. What made you, hi Lisa, what made you speak up despite the false doctrine of complementarianism? Uh, the inherent injustice of it, I think, and the unbiblical nature, how it clashes with the gospel that says, wait, in Christ there is no, greatest is least, then all of a sudden it's turned over. Be silent, but pray with your head covered out loud, be a prophet, but don't say anything like you just said, <laughs> you know? This can't be the Bible where we're talking about you know please read these letters for me in front of churches but don't you dare speak because he suffered yeah. a lot of speak and you deceivable women you should teach the the children and the women <laughs> and be sure and cover your head when you're talking to women because the men somewhere might be moved to lust <laughs> <laughs> that, that's you know that's, why, that's exactly the same reason I researched it before I did this. I, I knew in my heart that God was going to use me and that wasn't the truth, but I had you. to be sure. And I, I went and researched these two scriptures that were so opposite everything I saw when I read it. Now, if I had never read those couple of verses or sections about women, I would have thought, wow, Jesus loved women and will use women just as much as he does anybody else. And so will Paul. And they might have a little bit of cultural bias from the times there, but it sure seems like he's preaching a uh, spirit and one in Christ. Right. But then when you get to those, it's like, what? Your whole life is, you know, thrown in the air and you're like, well, none of this makes sense now. And, and that's where I was. And that, right. that's why I researched it. And, and unfortunately, people like it to mean that, Paula. Yes. They like that meaning and they stay right there and look no further into it because they want it to be true. And the thing is, if if you're a woman and you know God has called you to do something, let nobody get in your way. Try and stop us. Because if God wants to use you and you're willing, you will be used. And the thing is that when uh the, you know like the, for an example of how this teaching is bad is that in american history there's a woman named hutchinson and hutchinson something like that uh she was leading women's bible studies in her home right perfectly safe but the puritans didn't like her teaching at all even women so they put her on trial. She had medical conditions and they made her stand for two days in the presence of these men grilling her on every possible thing for two days. 
And her husband didn't even have a problem with it. He's like, she's teaching women. What's the problem? And they just condemned her, eventually exiled her to some island where it's known there were a lot of American Indians, you know, they call them Native Americans now, in the area. They left her there with her children. They slaughtered her and her children. Wow. And the men said, God punished her. Oh my gosh. That's how cold, unbelieving people masquerading as Christian teachers take these teachings. This is extreme, yeah. right? But you know, the witch thing happens happens every day because of that. They believe women yeah. are inherently evil and deceivable by the devil. Or if you had any intelligence or talent, you, right. were, you were a witch. Yeah, of course. And it, especially if you spoke your voice, if you had a voice. Had a, yeah, woman, if you had an opinion. Then you, you were definitely a threat to them and you were of the devil. And that's the um, thing. <clears throat> a threat is, is what people who are afraid who have delicate egos, mm -hmm. are not assured, don't have peace, are afraid yep. of threats. Yep. That's why it takes a real strong Christian man doesn't have any fear of equally strong Christian women. Right. Because there, it's not uh, about flesh. There's two the two questions. Okay, he elaborated on the Ohala and Ohalba. Ohalba. Um, okay. <laughs> and also, uh, Amanda asked, what if a woman's being abused and God hates divorce? He just expects the woman to stay getting beat. Of course not. No, no. Okay. What Jesus said, that's another thing. Is Jesus was asked if divorce was permissible for any and all reasons. Well, that's a no fault divorce that the rabbis were fighting about Hillel and, and somebody else, two different houses of rabbis, right? They were fighting to say, can we divorce a woman for any or no reason at all? Because that's what they wanted to do. If she burned the stake, they could throw her away and get somebody new, younger. And the other side said, no, it says she has. there has to be a reason to write her a certificate of divorce under Moses' law. They were asking Jesus to take sides. And he said, you got to have a reason. Okay. Even under the laws of Moses, a man had to care for the women and care for the slaves and could not abuse because abuse and neglect were grounds for her to be sent away with provisions. Mm -hmm. She was not to be thrown out. They wanted to throw her out without a reason. And Jesus said, no, that's what he's saying. And if you look at Paul's teachings on this matter, he says, God wants you to live in peace. You don't know whether you're going to save your spouse. Let them, if the unbeliever wants to go, let them go. Now, he doesn't say anything about abuse there, but he does also say, and I think he's talking to specific with, uh, couples and situations, and he says that this there's a problem. I surmise this, okay? I can't just pull it right off the page, but he's there's a think of a Christian woman whose husband is near death, and she wants to know, as a also a Jew, do I have to marry his brother? Remember that law? Uh huh, yep. The, but he's the saying, Redeemer. And he says he must be a believer. So he's advising her what to do because it seems that if he dies, he says, and she can marry again, but he has to be a believer. Mm. So there's a whole bunch of things going on in his advice. And so the, the teaching of the New Testament, Jesus, Paul, they're both on the same page, is you should live in peace. If you can't live in peace, you can split up, but try to get back together if you can. But God has called us to live in peace. Not to suffer at the hands, yeah, especially of uh, I, I've heard some pastors uh, and been appalled at some of the things I've heard in some of my local churches here, blaming the woman uh, for an emotionally, physically abusive man. That is yeah. such hogwash. It's unchristian. It's, it's totally unspiritual. I've seen a, a woman. She actually had to run from her husband. He had shot her in the head. He had pulled a shotgun out and shot it, but it jammed. And oh. her kids were there. Her head would have blown off if, if, if this hadn't a jammed up. So he went to prison for a long time and the pastor was still making it her fault. Somehow her fault. Now there are, yes, there are exceptions where the woman is the abuser, but by far it's the other way around. But God yeah. has called us to live in peace. No one should be subjected to that unless they're suffering for the cause of Christ. That's which right. Even men can do. And this is supposed to be the safest place for a woman and her children and yep. for Christian men to, to take a hard pharisaical approach. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, it's is ridiculous. telling me they're not even saved. If yeah, they have that, yeah that, that makes me feel, where is the love of Christ? Where is the, Do you think if Jesus was standing there, he'd go, well, she married him? You no, know, of course not. Right. That is so against the gospel. It, it absolutely is. And uh, it, it, the, these kind of uh, legalistic arguments are just horrific. So uh, he he asked about those two names I can't pronounce is that God is a jealous God who punishes those who turn their backs on him and chase after idols. Okay, that's under the law. Uh, it says, I'm trying to understand what specifically idolatry is, since everything's idolatry almost. Okay, look, the Bible in, to me, in scripture, when it talks about idolatry, it's literal idolatry. Carving idols, putting offerings to them, and worshiping before these things. Okay? Uh and there were all uh, often a giant idol that was set up in the temple and people would take miniature versions of them home. And it, it was believed that these demonic spirits would inhabit the larger vessel. And sometimes the lesser spirits would follow people home and they'd have like a household God, their little uh, familiar spirits. But uh, a lot of people say television is idolatry. This is idolatry. The Bible idolatry is literal idolatry. Now, there are instances where the love of money is a form of idolatry, but that's just that just means, hey, you're putting your trust in it. That's what it means. You're saying, I'm 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 good. I'm a, like the man that had so many goods that he had to build an extra barn and said, I'm just going to kick back because I'm safe. I'm going to live a life in luxury. And God said, you fool this tonight. Your soul's uh, required of you. It's because he put his trust in in something material for his stability. He rested in something other than God. That that is would be uh if you want to narrow down what idolatry is, it means to put your trust in something that's not God. Just like they put their trust in the golden calf to lead them out of Egypt or and uh people would pray before their household idols or offer their children to them. But just it, you could do the same thing with money uh, or fame or anything that you are trusting in that says, hey, I'm good now. I'm at peace now because I have X, Y, and Z instead of it being God. I think that would be the, the best uh, way to explain it. Um, what do you think, uh, Paula? Yeah, I mean, um, like you said, we got to go by Bible definitions and usages and context, and it is uh, worshiping primarily. You know, it you can, you know, Jesus will say, "Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also." Um, and people letting, you know, the parable about the weeds, uh, you know, the the seeds in the sower, and how the weeds would choke up and the cares of the world and all that sort of thing. But it isn't called idolatry. But we get the idea. Anything we put before God means there's a problem with the relationship because he's supposed to be our God and Savior. And if we accepted him, not just taking what we call fire insurance, you know, keeping out of punishment, but accepting the one that saved us as our adoptive parent, basically, um, you're not going to put anything in the way of that. If you're if you're saved, you shouldn't be wanting to do that. Now that's a matter of maturity, right? We're all going to let things get in the way, but that's a matter of maturity. And so, no, I wouldn't call that idolatry, that sort of thing. I would just say get your priorities straight, you know. Yeah, Amanda cracked me up because she's the one that asked earlier. So a woman's just got to put up with him, and she goes, so, "Too bad your husband didn't commit adultery. You're stuck with him." Said Jesus, "Never." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah true no no there's a reason if you're being abused you get out of there honey because he's not he's sh he's shirking his job as a husband he's supposed to care for you and nurture you and protect you and he's supposed to love you as christ loved the church and if he's not doing that and you're being beat and abused and that is not uh any place right. to be uh it says are there still these are more general questions than woman questions but are there still prophets in our time? Uh, well, I, I don't see the need for any new revelation of prophecy. God gave us his written word. I, every prophet that's called themselves a prophet since after Jesus died has been a false one. 
I, I haven't seen any new prophecy. I've seen people get dreams and visions about coming events, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're a prophet. They could just be getting some information. I don't see the need for God to use biblical prophets anymore. I, I don't see why it seems like he gave us everything. So I've never seen a real one. I've seen a lot of people call themselves that, but the standard for biblical to be a biblical prophet is 100% accuracy. Because if you speak any word that God did not tell you or something, they give you a false prophecy, they're to be put to death. That's God's standard. And I've yet to see anybody that calls themselves a modern prophet, not be incorrect on many things. What do you think, Paula? It's it's a gift listed in the spirit, list of spiritual gifts. I'm not a cessationist, but I do believe that there are certain gifts that are more for when something is changing, such as on the day of Pentecost. We don't all have tongues of fire light on us and speak in tongues. And Paul taught about that around First Corinthians 12 through 14, and said that uh, desire the greatest gift. The greatest gift is love. But then prophecy, he he elevated over tongues. Because tongues are assigned to unbelievers, prophecy is for believers. And what is prophecy? It's speaking words from God to the people. And he says, when you're, you know, he was actually rebuking the Corinthians and said, now when you have your meetings, I have this, you know, you you say one person speaking, another person speaking, and this chaos, basically. And he's saying, speak in turn, interpret in turn, and two or three prophets can speak one at a time. And if a prophecy comes to someone else sitting down, the other ones have to stop because everything must be done decently in order. And the other prophets can weigh what is said. That's nothing like the modern church service or the traditional church service where one person just speaks and speaks and speaks. We have two or three gifts of prophets. So it's like you have a multi, you know, multitude of elders, I mean, not a multitude, but several elders in a congregation. There's never supposed to be one head haunt you. And the thing is about prophecy is that it's speaking if God tells you to say something, okay? And I think in that sense, the, the gift of prophecy is still active. Not in the sense that you can write scripture, because the only people who could write scripture were taught by Jesus directly. But when it comes to prophecies, um, they are usually for specific situations, and it's a word from God that you say to somebody, and, but it's not that you have authority. Because like I said, you know, like we discovered from the scriptures, none of us has authority over each other, but we do have responsibilities to use the gifts we're given. And whether that gift is tongues or administration or prophecy or teaching or evangelism, those are all different ways that the spirit expresses one spirit, many parts of the body, and no part is greater than the other parts. So if someone calling themselves a prophet, I don't even like people calling themselves pastor so-and-so. Right. Right. Because it's a title. Mm -hmm. It's an ele elevation. And that's another one of those things that the servant, the abused people willingly put up with. They want pastors to spoon feed them and order them around. Even in the Old Testament, we have a situation where God says, the prophets prophesy lies and you, my people love it this way. So there are people who love that evil symbiotic relationship. And God never intended, I think this is the sin of the Nicolaitans, was this clergy laity class distinction uh, yeah. yep. where they were putting clergy over. This was happening in the second century where there were bishops, overseers, call, saying to people, you have to obey me as you would God before there were any popes. That's what that grew from. It was already started in the second century. And, and Constantine didn't come along until the third and the, the first council on Nicaea didn't even talk about that. They talked about liturgical calendar and the debate over the divinity of Christ. That was all they talked about. They didn't talk about the canon. Because they wanted it. They they wanted yeah. to have uh, be above the rest of the congregation. So, right. so they eventually kept the Bible and put people to death for trying to get the word of God in people. Yeah, which is an excellent proof against the Roman Catholic Church writing the Bible. Why were they trying to hide it if they right. wrote it? And putting people to death for translating it. That, mm -hmm. that was, doesn't make sense. But but the thing is that um, clergy laity is another fleshly lording over like the world instead of against the world, going against what Jesus taught and trying to lord over people. This is not what sh Christians should do. We should be humble. We should be servants. So Yeah, there's a lot less of that. Like uh, people elevate these 
TV pastors up to celebrity status. And what they say is, I mean, it's just, I, I think the modern church is not, I think they would have been shocked to see one guy standing at a pulpit talking for an hour and a half at people um, compared one, to what the first century church did based on the, what I see in the services there. The whole race platform with a pulpit and a choir and all that stuff and processional recessional is all from the pagan worship practices. They just, what Rome did is just slap a Christian veneer and take, you know, like the statues of uh, Semiramis and Tammuz. Yep, they called him Peter. They, the Zeus, uh, the Jupiter is actually Peter. Jupiter is Peter. Yeah, and Semiramis is now Mary. Yep, yep. Tammuz is baby. Mm -hmm. um, and just put a veneer over everything. And, and the Protestants Reformation was only a Reformation, not a revolution that it should have been because they only were complaining about indulgences and things like that, which is good. And going back to scripture was good, but they didn't give up the religion. Right. They didn't give right. up what was else was wrong that had been lost right. from the Bible. Well, praying um, to the dead saints, all that was, was their minor gods. They had yeah. a, a patron God of travel a patron god of lost items and they would these were lesser gods these were uh, right. demons, demons they worship and so they would just put saints names on top of them and then adopt all their pagan holidays mm -hmm. put christian all they did was put christian names on top of paganism even down to the little wafers and holding it up to the sun and saying that it turned the mithra cult were the ones that said you ate the body of your God and it turned into your literal God's flesh. Mm -hmm. It's never said that it's a, he said, do this and remember to me, this is my body and my blood. It's a representation of what I did for you on the cross for your healing and for the forgiveness right. of your sins. It I mean, never supposed to be the way it is there. Jesus is sitting there in his body and blood saying, this is my body and blood. What did right. they think? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he he hadn't died yet. Own flesh. How is the bread becoming? It's not. It's yeah. It's, and did you yeah. know the term hocus pocus came from people hearing the Latin mass and, and saying magical words do stuff? That's how you're hocus pocus kidding became. me. Now, that, that's a, I did a series on a book called The Reformers and Their Stepchildren that went over all of these every step of the way from the first century to the Reformation and how the Reformation did. You know, there's a lot of dark history there too, but that was one of the things they wanted this. They, like the Catholic Church, wanted there to be a state church. They wanted, yeah, the was Calvin. He was wicked. Yeah. He was the Pope of Geneva. He was a terrible yeah, person. He, he put people to death and kicked them out if they yeah. agreed with his doctrine. But the thing he is, that look, tulip at 26 years old, right out of Catholicism, why are people resurrecting that nonsense? I don't know, but I mean, Calvin was a lawyer. That was his training. But the thing is that at every step of the way, Christian people saying they're Christians and even having some doctrine right don't exhibit this life of a changed person. You know, Paul was not a product of his time. He was knocked off his high horse and was a different man after that. Yep. He did not act like a Pharisee. He renounced that. You know, he would use it to his advantage, like divide the Sanhedrin so he could get out of right. trouble. But of course. he threw all that away and said, I am not like that anymore. I'm a different person. And yet you don't see that in these church fathers. You don't see them with a changed life. You don't see them with a, a compassionate spirit. Right. That That's what I'm saying. People are looking for outer righteousness, Paula. They don't drink. They don't, they don't fornicate. They don't. Meanwhile, their hearts are self-righteous, judgmental. They have no compassion. I can't tell you, even when I was in the hospital, like really sick and with my disability and just lost my son's dad, the cruelest things I have ever heard from anybody came from these professing Christians wallowing in my misery, saying God's punishing me for preaching free grace as if it's, it's like, a new doctrine. It's like those... Uh, Puritans and Anne, H Anne Hutchinson. Um, oh. I've I've seen I'd say a person that was in this message board. These were Calvinists. We were arguing, but he he made a joke about having turkey servetus for Thanksgiving. Really cooked well, burnt, right? And what wine to serve with heretic? 
Oh, I mean, this is how me. evil people can be and call themselves the best saved elect Christians. But they're looking for fruit that isn't biblical. The, right. the real fruit of the spirit is joy, peace, long suffering, meekness, love, compassion. None of that's there. None that's of it. The first thing I'd ask anybody, I don't want to hear what your doctrine is till I see you living, understanding the gospel, acting like a saved person, yep. not a perfect person. But do you at least have love, joy, peace, something like that? Some of the fruit of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Do you care about people? Right. Do you have any compassion because you were shown compassion to be right. saved? And if you don't have that, I don't want to hear your doctrine. It's like the saying goes, I can't hear what you're saying when I see what you're doing. You know, and very similar. Your actions like that. are so loud. I can't hear what your mouth saying. Yeah. That's another one. That that's the thing is, is where is the love of Christ in a person? And there they I don't care how perfect that's first Corinthians 13. If I had all knowledge and could fathom all mysteries and I have not love, I have nothing. Yeah. That's I, what I, don't, uh, I don't get it. Like I I have never had an atheist say the cruel things to me that these people have said. I, right. I recently had a lady, she's been stalking me four years. So one of my viewers tried to get um, a fundraiser going to help me because my insurance won't pay for the uh, reconstruction of my upper jaw. And he did a thing and I got it down as cheap as I could, uh, a little under 13,000. Wow. And I can get my bone grass and I've got to get all this replaced at the top. And it's going to take about three mm. months. Well, this lady that's been stalking me contacted the website and told them I'm a fraud, edited a bunch of my stuff together. So my surgeon had to do that. And then she bragged how she got this Jezebel and her scheme shut down that I didn't have MRSA. Hello. Look, a third of my arm was cut out. I got scars yeah, all over my body. And, and she claimed that she doesn't know me, but claims that, and she makes it her life to, to try to hurt me in any way. So she got it shut down the same night. Ultimate Mordecai told his viewers to everybody give a dollar and we would have gotten everything. We would have had my money, but she had it shut down. And by the time they got it brought back up and proved I wasn't a fraud, it was too late. So this is the kind of work these people are bragging, saying the angels are rejoicing because a single mm -hmm. disabled mother couldn't get her mouth surgery. Again, that's Anna. What that's what God is happy that she did with her time. Again, with Ann Hutchinson as the poster child of, you know, the cold satanic fake calling itself Christianity. That, that's just people should be ashamed of themselves when they would divide the body or hamstring the body or condemn people who are speaking the truth in love, speaking the gospel accurately and saying things like I've heard on a video that saying, um, if you know, what would you do if you saw it came to a church where a woman was the pastor? And they say, shut it down. They don't care if people are not saved. They don't care if they're not nurtured. What matters to them is this hierarchy and their power and control. Mm -hmm. And that is not a safe person. I, I don't care what words come out of their mouth. It doesn't, I don't know how, like, I don't like to judge people's salvation, you know, but what I don't understand is how anybody can have a, a supernatural obsessive hatred for years for someone they've never met. Like, yeah. I don't understand. That's demonic. I feel they're doing, I believe it's satanic too. I think it is a spirit moving this person uh, against me. I mean, I, I'm talking everything that I try to do or even not do, just anything. Even when I was grieving when my son's dad died last year, I was mocked and they made a video of me crying, saying I was crying to get money out of people. I never asked for money for anything. I don't know what she's talking about, but they did that. They edited it. It's still out there today. And uh, I, I don't, I don't want to say people aren't saved, but when they come against the gospel, mock it, despise it, call it greasy grace, cheap grace. How in the world is the Holy Spirit in them? I don't know. And I agree. We shouldn't, you know, we can't say whether somebody's saved or not, but we can disfellowship yeah. and call out. But I don't understand no. how, because I have such a sensitivity to Christ and, and the message of the gospel, I don't know how I would ever hate it and want to work right. against it. Like, I don't know how somebody gets to that place. 
Right. It's like with the, you know, the whole group that you're involved in with Sin City Preacher and all those, the people, I don't agree with everything they believe, you know, like I'm not an annihilationist, for example, right. but what I see is the spirit. First of all, I see that you got the basic, you guys have the basics, right? And you care about people and you act like Christians. And that's what matters to me most. And that's what should matter to every Christian is our unity in Christ and being grateful and humble and treating each other as better than ourselves. That's all scriptural. And when one part of the body hurts another, the other parts are supposed to suffer with it. Whatever happened to that? You know, that's biblical. That's when Paul's teachings about the body of Christ. Uh, just... I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Miss Paula. Oh, no problem. I, I, I just, I just saw it. I'm trying to understand what the message, not a bad thing to stop smoking or drinking, Renee. I'm getting tired of you saying the same thing about it. Some of us don't brag about it. God help us quit and we're grateful for it. No, honey, you're, you're, you're misunderstanding me. I'm saying, I'm not saying it's bad to quit drinking. I, I don't like to drink either. So I, I don't even care about that. My point is people look for outer righteousness, Kirk. And they don't have the inner righteousness. They're looking for outer fruit. Do they drink? Do they fornicate? They're looking for outer things. And they're missing the more important spiritual things like compassion, joy, love, and peace. I'm not saying I'm not saying it's wrong for people to quit smoking and drinking. That's that's where would you get that I'm saying that? I'm trying to say this stuff out here is not as important as this stuff in here. And if you got all this stuff out here, you quit all the bad habits, but you're unregenerate, it doesn't really matter. That's my point. If your heart hasn't changed, if you don't have compassion and peace and love for people, it doesn't matter all this good stuff out here you're looking for. That's not primarily what we judge for fellowship. It, it's, it's Are they living in love as a Christian? So I'm not saying it's a bad thing to stop drinking or smoking. I'm tired of you saying that. I, I I don't, I'm not against that. If you have an issue of drinking or smoking, by all means, get rid of it. God will help break these things off. He's broken off many bad habits in my life, including heroin and cocaine. So uh, I, I am great, grateful for that. And I'm glad he did that for you. But please don't take what I'm saying the wrong way. I'm not saying it's wrong to stop those things i'm saying let's not overlook the real fruits of the spirit and don't judge somebody by their outward behavior when they're clearly showing christian love and compassion uh from the inside let's give them some grace on these issues sometimes they take longer and uh just because somebody has a reformed life doesn't mean they're christian either religion can do that so can willpower so can aa so that's not evidence of somebody being saved. That's all I'm saying. I say, I, I don't know how some people hear some of the things that I'm not saying. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I, I never would have thought me saying that people would think that I'm against quitting drinking or smoking. And that, that was what, you know, Paul was saying in, the, in 1 Corinthians 5, where he says, throw the, out the wicked man from among you. He's talking about somebody who's making the faith look bad. Something is bringing disrepute upon the whole congregation. And he threw them out of fellowship. He didn't say they were lost. You know, he just said they can't fellowship with you. They have to be taught a lesson. Well, you don't teach a lesson to somebody who doesn't belong to you. So he's, te he's this is a believer who had to be thrown out of fellowship, handed over for sa to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so his spirit may be saved. And then in 2 Corinthians, they take them back. So this is discernment when you have to disfellowship someone over their behavior. And, but personal vices is not exactly the thing, you know, living in sin openly. Yeah. You got to disfellowship because this is bad. Give for, the church a bad name. Yeah. But stuff. your personal, you know, your addictions or whatever, you know, or some people eat too much food or eat the wrong right. food. Um, and that, that is where you have to show that compassion and try to encourage people. If it's something they can improve, get them help. Yeah. Act like you care. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah, I, I was told when I was in full heroin addiction, I'm talking about vomiting every time I try to stop in day if for weeks at a time in sweats, dehydration, hospitalized, bad stuff, right? 
um, real Mexican tar from Mexico right there on the border, just constantly loaded, sick as a dog. And uh, I would go to the church and they tell me I had to repent of my sin to be saved. So I couldn't even come to God until I was clean enough for him. Mm. So I, I got these on my wrist. You can see uh, both wrists, stitches, because I, I was done. Even God, even God wouldn't take me, you know, and that is why I fight against the false gospel and wrong repentance for salvation, because it might be okay for, no, it's not okay because even people that don't have any real bad habits, it's still not going to save them. So, you know, wrong repentance, no salvation. If you're trusting in your ability to not sin or keep the law, same thing, you're not trusting in Christ. So I, I really come against it for people that are as messed up as me lest they think that they got to clean up good enough for God to accept them. You yeah, know, and I did get medical help. It took medical help for me. It took medication so that I wouldn't be sick. I hear all these miracles. Well, I just woke up and I didn't have any withdrawals. Uh, I was sick as a dog for months, for months. So yeah. that didn't happen for me. I don't know what kind of drugs they were on. It was miraculously cured like that. But it, uh, apparently some people say it, they did have it. And if so, good for them. It didn't happen for me that way. And I'm not going to enforce my experience on somebody else. I just know you come to Christ just as you are. And he loves you and he will save you. He has done everything for your salvation. And that's the message I want to fight for. I'm not against people cleaning up their lives. I'm still cleaning up mine. Yeah, that's that's what we're supposed to, you know, work out your salvation, not work for. Yeah, I, I'm so. I'm completely going to continue. I and I hope he. And the more I get better, the more stuff I didn't know was wrong with me. I'm always finding stuff in me that I'm going. Well, that that I didn't even realize that was wrong. That's really wrong of me to think that way. You know, I'm always growing, and and I hope I do. And and like Paul said, sometimes I get exhausted. Who will save me from this body of death? I am constantly fighting against my flesh with anger, with, with self, you know, self-centeredness, with, you know, selfishness, whatever. I'm always dealing with these issues. I just, I, I get frustrated. My hang up is self-righteousness and no compassion and uh, not giving people any grace in any areas. That's right. my issue. So I'm a little sensitive on that, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, that's understanding the gospel again. It's just, you accepted an adoption offer. It's not, you know, like Zeus with his lightning bolts waiting to shoot you down if you make step one toe out of line. This is the God who became man instead of the man who became God, like other religions, coming down to suffer and show you and do the things you couldn't do. And you receive it as in gratitude to be reconciled. That's what it's all about. First Corinthians uh, five and second Corinthians or second Corinthians five and first Corinthians 15 that talk about be reconciled to God. That's a gospel is be reconciled. You can't scare people into it. You can't trick them into it. You can't guilt them into it. It's you're in this orphanage, this terrible place, this orphanage, and somebody's come to adopt you. Do you want it? Do you want us as a family? That's what that's what an adoptive family does. Do you want to join this family? Not do you just want to live in a nice house? Because if you want it for that reason, that's the wrong reason. You're accepting the person, the family, This in this case, right. God. And so you have to make an honest free will choice offer and say, do you want God to be your adoptive parent? Do you want to be reconciled? And remember, he is God and you're not, you know, this is, you know, you're the child here. And so you accept it with gratitude and humility. That's the only way to accept a gift. And that's what salvation is. That's the gospel message. Do you want to be reconciled to God? Do you want to be adopted? Anything else? It's the wrong gospel. And when people say you got to clean up first or when you get saved, life is going to be worse for you because I'm going to lay down the law on you for your well, flesh you or reason, yeah. then, you know, and you can't do this and you can't do this. I remember, you know, my, my dad telling me he was told by his parents that there was a lady who said you must not sing three quarter time music in the church because that's dance music. I oh mean, my goodness. What? They don't understand the gospel. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm just saying they got it totally messed up. What this is about. David dancing to the streets. Praise God with your percussion instruments. Praise yeah. God. With the Psalm 150. Praise God with Psalm 150. And every vision of heaven has people, angels or whoever, 
falling down, playing music, shouting, Dance you know, in the street. it's party time up there. Yeah. <laughs> so none of this song. A lot of the churches are, you, you can only play well, an organ or piano and it's got to be the other extreme and, where it's just noise and and it's and it's all about the experiences yeah, yeah that's experiential where they repeat those call down fire lord send yeah. fire lord over and over again trance music you know it's the same it's it's one of the, the hill song has a lot of that stuff you know it's all like a concert when i first got here i joined one of those big churches and it was dark and it was like having a concert every morning then the pastor would come up for 30 minutes and tell some anecdotal jokes and maybe one line of scripture and then a self-help sermon on that one line of scripture. David had his giant. What's the giant in your life? No, I want to know what the scripture means and what, you know what I'm saying? How they do that. I, I want to know the depths of God's word and the mysteries of his word. And I couldn't find it anywhere. So I said, well, I guess I'm just going to go home and let God show me. So I couldn't get it yeah. in the church. So at least my, my, my church now does discuss God's word, you know, and, and how to apply it to your life. That's, that's the thing is Sunday school, even when I was growing up, was more of a self-help group therapy sort of thing than, you know, what does this verse mean to me? You can't know what it means to you until you know what it meant to its original audience in the, in the you know, its intended audience, not, not as entertainment, but as who are you writing to? Because words aren't written in a vacuum. These letters are written to people with real problems and, and the Old Testament histories and poetry and prophecy. Then you understand. It's like what we did with Genesis. You understand what's going on in the first three chapters. Then you know what Paul means when he talks about it to use it as an analogy for deception, for example, not hierarchy, but deception. And that's why people need to understand half expository teaching, then you can apply it to your life. Then you can draw analogies, but you can't do it before then. Right. Uh, I wanted to mention something on uh, different doctrines. Not everybody's going to agree, uh, agree on every single thing. Some people uh, disagree on uh, whether people perish or whether hell lasts all of eternity. This to me, as long as people know there is a judgment and it's horrible and that eternal life is a free gift through Christ, it, it doesn't matter how long they think the hell experience lasts. It's all awful and you're going to stand before God and you don't have to agree with me on that. Some people believe the earth is flat. I do not. Um, I have been pressured into trying to believe it, but I got too many scientific problems with it. And uh, so I but I don't hate people that do. So I would ask everybody. Um, not to not to call people names that I am friends with. If you know I'm on a panel with someone and they're my brother or sister Christ and I love them and they believe something that you think is silly, it's okay, but please don't come on my channel and call them names and then attack me because you say I put up with them and refuse them. I, I, I allow people to believe what they believe and I love them because they are part of the body of Christ. And I know they're part of the body of Christ because they trust in the same savior and they have shown me much grace and I want to show them grace back and I want to show you grace. And I wouldn't like it if anybody said anything ugly about you either. So try to put yourself in my position. You wouldn't want somebody saying something about someone you cared about. Try not to do that to me. It puts me in a very precarious situation and it's hurtful to the people around me. And if someone did that to you on my channel, I would say, please don't talk to my brother in Christ that way. So please um, try to be considerate there. I, I get amazed Paula at um, uh, some of these channels are pretty much dedicated to calling other people names. I mean, their whole mm -hmm. ministry, I saw one guy's channel. Well, one guy's that Ben Redeem guy for a while, his whole channel was me. Just, Renee is wrong, you know, this, she's a Jezebel, she's wrong on this, she's wrong on this, the whole thing, okay, mark and avoid means if you think somebody's wrong on the doctrine, mark them and say this person's wrong on the gospel, or the, this person's a heretic, and this is why, and just leave them alone, right, in that, mm -hmm. if you really felt that way, first you should probably approach me and ask me what my opinion is and why I think that way, and then if you had correction 
and I didn't take it, then mark, right? But I don't think uh, I don't think it's right to make our entire channels about one person or because that's more of a personal I don't like you. Don't right. You, that's driven more from the flesh than any obligation to God for the purity of his word. <laughs> that's what I right. Think. I mean, there are people we all know, like the Joel Osteens and TV preachers like that, that are teaching absolute heresy and showing by their life that they really don't get it one right. way or another. Um, but I went in front of that house and I said, Lord, I'm going to have that mansion when he already had a room mansion, but he's got to have that one. And yeah. The Lord and, delivered it to his hands. And all of you give till it hurts. Give, you know, pull out your credit cards. Why don't you do that? Yeah. Where is that Why money? It's going that? into your house. Of course it works for you. Of yeah. course the prosperity gospel works for you. Because <laughs> everybody's sending <laughs> their money to you. That's right. why it works for you, but it doesn't work for the people you're telling to send it. Right. I don't see you giving out the money and right. see what comes back, you know, and that's yeah. investing anyway. That's not giving. Uh, it just, it makes me like, yeah, exactly. You're, it, I'll, he'll give you a hundredfold. I don't think that's quite what he meant, but okay. No. Uh, it's funny how um, the seed is almost always spiritual, but um, it, it cracks me up how, they will do that. See, it worked for me. I believed God for a jet. I said, no, you just, you just like totally manipulated people into sending you a lot of money mm -hmm. by saying that they will have what you have if they send you what they got mm -hmm. and they believed you. And they didn't claim it. Saying, I need all this money uh, to preach the gospel. I've never heard him preach the gospel once. Every single show is send me a sow a seed money and he tells you about some financial miracle he got because he gave away some money and God like multiplied it. Mm -hmm. He Every gave away his pocket change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Right. And, that and really hurts my heart because I know that's what a lot of people think about the Christian church. And that's the thing is people are so zoned on you stay in your little role playing your little pink box while the world is on fire all around us and people are being lost and the church is being misrepresented. And all you can think about is I don't know my place. There's something wrong with that, with priorities, you know, shut down the church because a woman's in charge. Uh, and Graham Lott. Shut it down. Yeah. yeah. One guy just uh, that Gene Kim did one. Women aren't supposed to be pastors. He was the top 10 wicked Jezebel women pastors out there. I'm like, why are they Jezebel? Are they teaching wrong? Like, I just And what about the men who are teaching wrong? But the thing is that th this is so backwards in their priorities and they don't care about the lost world at all. They care about marking off your boxes and playing your roles and staying in your places, you know, that this is more important to them than reaching the lost world. And they're, crying about workers for the harvest while telling half of them to stay home. This is, and shut up. This is against the gospel of Christ. This is against evangelism. It's against the Holy Spirit. So. Yeah, I agree. And again, yeah. it, without love, it's all pointless. It's a bunch of noise anyway. Yeah. Even, even if, even if you're right on everything, like, like you said, even if I have this and I have that and I have that and I have the faith to move mountains, it doesn't matter. If I don't have love, it's, it's worthless. Exactly. And love, I like to remind people, love isn't some mushy feeling you have. To, it's, it's an action. It's putting someone else's needs above yours at the moment. It's stepping out and bearing their burden. It's saying, hey, I'm just going to sit here and grieve with you for a while. I'm just going to let you feel it. I'm not going to make it about me. I'm not going to say, oh, I know how you feel one time this. No, let them have it. Let them own it and just sit there and be with them. Sometimes right. love is a, is a way of you giving you, giving of your time, giving of your goods, giving of any compassion. It's it's not a, a mushy feeling. That's, that's, a, 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 that's a chemical response in your body. That's not love. Lo right. Love is to to make a decision that I'm going to put me and what's going on with me last so that you can get your needs met. And that's what needs to be more of that. That's what agape means. It's a selfless love. It's not just God's love. It's selfless love. Whereas brotherly love is a, you know, give and receive and, and interaction. And that's why Jesus, why Peter was grieved the third time 
because Peter says, Peter says, uh, Jesus says, do you agape me? And he says, I phileo you. Right. The third time Jesus says, do you phileo me? And he was grieved because he's saying, do you even have that love? Not, not even the selfless love. That's what grieved him. It's not the third time, you know, and that's what Christians don't get is there's a selfless love. And if you don't have that, are you saved? And that's a question you ask yourself, not other people. All you can do is if they have a profession of faith that matches what the, the scripture says, then they are your brother and sister in Christ. But if their behavior is such that they are not turning, they're not, we all sin, but we, we hate our sin. I, I tell people, if you keep hating what you're doing, you know, you, you know, you're not supposed to, that's good. Yeah. It's not how often you fall. It's just that you hate this stuff. Right. That's telling you that there's a clash of spirits there. You know, there's right. a, the, the, the alive and the not alive. And right. that's what people don't understand is that this is that's that's the struggle. It's not that you are lost. It's because if you were lost, you wouldn't have this problem. And so yeah, you'd be like, hey, who cares? Yeah, right. So and that was the problem in Corinth is they didn't hate that sin. Right. They had to tell them, well, look, you're supposed to have a problem with this. This is bad. I always thought that thing with Peter was one, a way for God to comfort him so that he could, for he denied him three times, maybe a chance to profess his love three times. But also Peter learned a very humbling lesson about boasting at his faithfulness for God. Mm -hmm. I'll go to the, I'll die for you, Lord. He was boasting. And whereas John boasted in Jesus's love for him, right. God, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he boasted in Jesus's love, not his own. And I always look for that in Christians too. When they, I call them testifonies <laughs> all about what they did and how much they love God instead of the realization of God's love for them and what he did for them. I do. I keep an ear out for that. And I'm like, where's Jesus in any of this? This is all what you did. Right. But we, hear, saved, though? we hear people yeah. say, um, ever since I was saved, God told me this that I'm going to do. And God told me I'm going, I'm special and I have this mission and I'm Ooh. me, 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 me. You know, it's all about me and how I am called. And you have to listen to me because I heard the voice and I, 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 you know. That, that's exactly what you're saying. It, it's a, a saved person says what he did for me. He changed me. He did this. He did that. And I'm so happy and grateful. And, you know, they try, try to pass that on. So this is a very disturbing trend, though. I've seen so many new Christians that get this attitude. I don't need any advice. You know, why does God send teachers to the church? I don't need to, you know, I know everything I need to know. Um, you can't tell me anything. Um, I'm, I'm saved. And therefore I know, I know I need no one to teach me. They take that out of context. That isn't what John was saying in that context at all, but they say, I don't need you. I don't need to listen to experienced Christians. I don't need to do anything, but what I feel like doing, because I've got God's direct line here telling me stuff. Oh you know? yeah. I get messages from the father told them this about me all the time. And I'm like, dude, why don't you just talk to me? I talk to him constantly. It's funny <laughs> that God never given me a message about anybody else's behavior, but my own. Mm -hmm. So why are you getting messages about my behavior? He could talk to me. He lives right here. He could just tell me. Exactly. Hey, whenever, you know, if God's dealing with me, even if I feel like it's somebody else's fault, he never tells me what that other person did wrong. It's always what I can do different. Right. Always. So I'm like, but I can't tell you the amount of the father. And I'm telling you this in love. The Holy Spirit told me and they try to correct me on the grace gospel. Always. Right. Uh, you, you are not moving me on that. You're not moving me on that because I know that's the only way to salvation. And I will not corrupt it, make an excuse for it, lessen it, belittle his grace, tell you you got to do something to get it, keep it, or prove it. I can't do it. That's okay. supposed to be our attitude as Christians, that nothing stops you from doing what God told you to do. You don't go out and try to stop some other Christian from God what God told them to do. Because we're the body of Christ. We each have different things to do. Um, one spirit, many gifts. And if they're trying to tell you 
what whether it's your flesh or whatever it is that you're you have to be restricted then we're talking about somebody getting in the way of God's will. Right. Nothing and nobody should stop you from doing what you're gifted to do. And if the churches won't listen, you go someplace else because God is calling you and testing you in some ways too, because he will test us in our disagreements and in our disappointments and say, you know, if you know you've been given a gift and you know you're going to use it, then if some door shuts, another door opens, you don't just say, I guess I wasn't supposed to do that. Right, right. So that's the thing with, you know, this, this topic is so much bigger than just what women can do. Cause as soon as you ask, what can women do? You've already conceded the argument. Right. Right. Yeah. Because you're, what you should, you're, you're limiting them in the very question you're asking. Right. We should be saying, what can Jesus do with you? Whatever he decides to do with you. And if you don't get in the way of that, that's the issue. You're not supposed to get in somebody else's way, but we're, we get in our own way. Sometimes we get in God's way. I like, I think I might word it that way in the description though. I think I might okay. just because it, it, it gets people to look at it. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like, what are, what can women do? What is right. their role in the church? Because I, I, I want people to hear the truth about it. And if they, if it's up front that it's, this way they they won't click they won't watch. Right. i want people to understand that we're all one body that right. we're all one and that god can use and he doesn't judge by the flesh and you know? that nobody has authority in their flesh your flesh doesn't get you any entitlements and that's what it is entitlement mentality because of my flesh or because of my upbringing i get something you don't get because I'm a male, I'm allowed to hold this position and the hope, the best you can hope for is to be married to me. Yeah. And That's and the it. thing is, if, if they're being humble, they're say they're being humble servants of God, right? Nobody fights for the last per place in line. Nobody fights to stay on the lowest rung of the ladder. If you're fighting for your position, you are not a servant. Right. People say I'm an under rower. Did they understand what an under rower was? These are double decker galleys, right? Slaves, galley slaves on the oars. Wow. If you're on the lower level, you don't get potty breaks. Understand? Nobody gets potty breaks. There's people above you. Oh wow. wow. And you, an under rower, is getting crapped on by everybody. Oh, wow. You are not in the crisp uniform on the helm steering the ship giving new orders. If you're an under rower, what are you doing at the helm in a crisp uniform? You're supposed to be on the bottom getting everybody throwing crap at you. Right. That's wow. where the leaders are. That's crazy. Paul, so, thank you for coming to tell us all the research that you've done on this. It's something I hold close to my heart because I, I've just seen so many people hurt by it and limited by it. And like I said, my hands, and like you said, they gag me and tie my hands. I, I, I'm I'm hopeless in my home church. I I'm worthless there, except to give my money to the missionaries, which is the only reason they I like your money. So I, it, well, you know, my church is really good about that. They're they're, you know, my pastor is a very godly man, and he believes every he believes he's doing the right thing. You know, he was taught this doctrine through his independent fundamental Baptist teacher Jack Hiles, which you know was very patriarchal, and um, uh. He, you know, he loves God. It's just, that's just the way it is. It's tradition. And that's just the way it is. And uh, it's the only real gospel church I can find in my area. I love my pastor. I love the people there. It's a tiny little fellowship, good people. I just, I'm worthless there. I can't really do anything except just support the missionaries through the church. You know, like that, that's how I feel. My, my contribution is limited except when I buy snacks for Sunday school once a month. I mean, that's like all I can really do because I can't, I can't really do anything every now and then I'll bring someone there to get baptized. You know, I, I, I can't do anything else. I'm, I'm limited. I can't even speak in church. So, um, that's their loss. That's all I can say is everybody well, will give an account elsewhere. Like you said, Miss Paula, use it where right. God puts me. And, and that's just what I'm going to do. It makes me very, very sad um, that people are still stuck in the flesh like this. But um, I hope this gave you guys some understanding of these really hard to understand verses. You know, how could Paul lift up all these sisters and name all the things that they're doing, but then say they're not allowed to say anything? 
that's not what was going on there. And hopefully you'll go through here and listen to what Ms. Paula's uh, telling you about uh, how uh, these verses were taken to consider all women, but it was very specific women and situations that were going on in the church at that time. Uh, and it has to be applied that way, not in general. So um, I really appreciate it, Paula. We're going to put Paula's link to where you can get her book. She's written a very informative book on this subject uh, and references all the scriptures and all the information she was talking about in the original languages, etc. cetera. So um, when I upload this, I will put the link to her book uh, up so that you can contact her or wherever uh, the book is, is available. Okay. What's the name of it again? You are all one debunking hierarchy in Christianity. You are all one debunking hierarchy in Christianity. That, and that's not just male and female. That's, that's everything. Clergy, laity, anything. Yep. So this is fantastic. Thank you so much, Paula, for being with us. And thank you, uh, chat room, for coming out. Well, we had over 100 people in here a little while ago live. Oh, wow. So that's, that's fantastic. And I'm sure a, a couple of thousand will see it before the week's out. Well, thank you for having me on. It was a pleasure. I'm glad to help. That's that's why I do this. It's just we need to free everybody because men are hurt by this as well. There are men who have taught, told also of testimonies of uh, being denied the woman they wanted to marry because her father wouldn't allow it. To, you know, all oh, of this wow. patriarchy stuff. So there's men get get hurt by this and they feel they have to be leaders when they're not gifted to do this. And right. It hurts everybody. It hurts the body of Christ. Sure. Yeah, and, that's what I know, think too. Yeah, like I told so, you, that poor guy that got saved on my channel was told he was sinning to further listen to me, even though he got saved on my channel. Yeah, that that's just wrong. So. All right, God bless you guys. See you soon. Night. Bye.